We ask that you continue to instruct us, you continue to direct us. Help us to not just be people who hear these very important things and do nothing about them. Help us to obey you. Come near to us, dear Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, we are going to learn um, some memory verses. But before that, I would like to know people that want to share their testimonies in this meeting. Please raise your hands. Okay, I will just give you numbers in the order you would testify. Please let me see your hands. I'm just seeing three hands. Okay, you go first, second, then you be the third. So um, we are going to learn memory verses first. Please understand that we've started. Don't wait for, okay, when um, Pastor Ita comes back on, that is when you're going to be fully, you know, concentrating and listening. Every part of the meeting is very important. Whatever we are doing, just jump in. Be very intentional about it. Okay. Good morning, everyone. So we're going to be learning a memory verse this morning. Um, for those who are, who are joining us for the first time, you're welcome. Um, the essence of us doing this is to enable us to up scriptures. For those of you in the first service, we heard one of our sisters testify of the beauty of being able to learn these memory verses this way, and she's been able to teach them to children. It's a wonderful way, it's a more effective way of storing up um, scriptures rather than opening your Bible and trying to cram or memorize um, what you're seeing word for word. Now, don't take this as something childish, even though the kingdom of God is likened unto a child. Be humble enough to jump in and learn. She's not the first person to thank God for this. We've had people who have said for years they've been struggling to memorize scriptures. But all of a sudden, they are able to memorize more than sometimes in chapters. They are able to cover up chapters. They're able to cover up multiple verses of the scripture. And another beauty of this is that it helps you to fight when the enemy comes attacking your mind, your thoughts. Ephesians 6 describes it as a sword of the spirit. We heard Pastor talk about it earlier if you were paying attention. So it's a very beautiful way to war. It helps your shield of faith grow. And if you read the book of Psalms, it says, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. So being able to hide God's word in your heart is what keeps you from sinning against God. So I'll expect you to please jump in and... Um, don't be left behind. It's simple. It's easy. Just do well to sing along. Be humble enough to sing along. So this morning, we're going to be learning Micah 6, verse 8. This is actually from the New King James Version. A lot of scriptures, we, we did this from the New King James Version. We have others from BSB, NIV, and the rest. But majority are from the New King James. Now, um, this is how this one goes. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's how it sounds. So, for those that know it, we're just going to sing it together once. Then those that don't know it, we'll try to learn it alongside. So everybody that knows it, let's go. One, two, go. He has shown you, oh man, what is good. 
And what does the law require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, for those that didn't know it, I would go line by line. I did that so that you hear how it sounds and you grab the tune. So, we'll start with the first line. It goes this way. You repeat after me. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. Let's go. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. Let's go again. He has shown you. He has shown you, O oh man, For the last time, let's go. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. Next line goes this way. And what does the Lord require of you? Does that line. Again. Again. Now let's go from the first line. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the law require of? Let's take those two lines again. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the law require? Now the last line. But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That last line. The last line again. Now let's try from beginning. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the law require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. Let's take it again. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the law require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. Okay, so now we're going to attempt something. We're going to take it away from the screen, and you try to sing it. I was begging you earlier to be at the edition. So just attempt. It's easy. It's easy, right? Let me believe with you that it's easy, even if you don't believe. So let's rest together. One, two, go. Some people are not singing. All right, let's go again. Okay, I'm hearing some beautiful parts in there. Now we're going to do it for the last time beautifully. Add your parts for those of you that can sing. For the sake of some people, one more time, let's go. To love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. That was a very beautiful one. I saw people sing and I'm encouraged. So let's have it back on the screen. Now we're going to recite it. Micah 6 verse 8. And then you say it. You start with the Bible passage and then you recite it. So let's do it together. We're going to do it twice with the screen and twice without the screen. So let's go together. One, two, go. Micah 6 verse 8. 
He has shown you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you. Let's go again. Micah 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you. Take it away. Now let's go. Micah 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you. For the last time. Micah 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, Amen. I hope we've taken the lessons from that. What were the three major things that you, from this memory verse, you learned that God is expecting of you? One, two, three. Amen. So we'll take the testimonies now. You have five minutes each, but of course, you don't have to exhaust the time if you don't have to. Good morning, everyone. My name is Arita Isin. I want to thank God for healing for the past two weeks or more i've been ill not like sick from headache cold body pains weakness it was very bad like if i'm walking or standing if you should push me i can just fall down there was no stamina at all but i'm thanking god for mercy his mercy because the only strength i had was in church during church service Bible study or church. At home, I would sleep all through. I wasn't able to do anything. But last Sunday, Pastor was talking about identifying the problems. And last Sunday, I had no cough at all throughout the week. It just happened in church. I'm thanking God for that too, that I'm okay now. So, Different people prayed for me. I said, may God bless all of you. Thank you. But when my shepherd prayed, she sensed unforgiveness and I was ungrateful. That was true. I've not been new for a very long time. So I wasn't thanking God enough. And a few days back, I had a little issue with my dad. So I, I didn't forgive him. So that was why the illness was prolonged. So after I said a prayer of forgiveness for myself, asking God for forgiveness and asking God to forgive my dad, that Sunday I was healed, like I was okay. From there till now I'm okay, I'm fine. I say may God's name be praised. Good morning, everybody. My name is Emmanuel James. I want to thank God for what God has done for me. I want to thank God's face for my for healing. For God has been faithful to me since I started this church February this year. I've never, I've not taken malaria drug or something. So this is something that's been happening. It used to be every month I would be sick, I would be going to the hospital. So I want to give glory to God that God has been faithful to me. I want to thank God too for my sister that is an biased state. The flood that happened and that happened to enter our house and our shops. So I want to thank God that nothing she saved and sound the children, the husband, they are fine. So I'll give glory to God for that. I also want to thank God for my work, for giving me uh, one of the best, let me say the best boss 
I want to thank God for him. I want to thank God for the job that God has really been faithful and helping me to be able to cope with people. It happened this month that almost every blessed day, different people will come with different troubles. I want to thank God for uh, my brother, Brother Emmanuel, that is also working there. He, re he really helped me a lot to, to handle people. At times I want to overreact and I will just look at his face, his face, it will just be quiet. So I will come back to myself. I want to thank God for using him there. They really helped me to manage, uh, to manage anger. So I want to thank God, God has helped me and the, I used to be, I have anger problem like up to a hundred percent. So I want to thank God that it's God has helped me. God has been faithful that I can be with all these people with all their troubles and I'm okay. Instead of that, we still go back to them, even talk to them again in a peaceful way. This is opposite of me. So I want to give glory to God for helping me to, to, to have this new life. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Joel Itek. I want to thank God on behalf of a family, a family that we do go to preach for and also do follow up for. So is a family of one Mr. Dr. Okun. He's actually very sick. Ah, he's sick. I mean, I say very sick. He's normal, but some disabilities due to I don't know whether to call it partial paralysis. His right hand, he cannot really move the right hand. He has other issues, internal issues. So when we were told to go and follow up on that family and to be sharing God's word with them, again, at the beginning, it was challenging for me to go and be visiting an elderly person and all of that. But I thank God for the grace. And I thank God because he has been bringing light in the family and uh, hope is being restored. We prayed for them and uh, even for his health. And there has been a lot of improvements. His right hand, I couldn't move at all. Now he can at least move the hand and he can do many other things that he couldn't do before. So I bless God for that. And I want to thank God because one of those days when we went there, he told us about a challenge his son had. So his son, I think is someone that went to an army school and due to the training he has received so he had been posted to different places to also serve but along the line he got admission and at some point he had to go and get his admission later but he needed to take permission from the number one man in charge and that person was not around i don't know the names very well please pardon me so the person was not around so he took permission from the person that is under the main person and it happened that since he did not have a direct permission from the highest ranking person. As he went, something happened. These Biafran guys, because around Igbo State that the guy is, the gods on their way and a lot of issues. And um, he was, first of all, retained. And at some point, the, the father communicated with his son, but later on, he couldn't hear anything from him again. Anytime he calls the number, another person will pick and will tell him, you cannot speak with your son now. So he was really worried. Now, ready for him to be in a condition where he has this health issue, his wife cannot go anywhere. She's around with him at home every time. In fact, when we go to the house, their bed is in the parlor. He has a seat beside the, parlor, beside the bed. So every time we come, he's always on that seat. He's always on that seat. So I was looking at the situation when he told us, I knew that this really bothered him. So we, we were asked to pray for the his child and he gave us a picture first we inquired then we prayed for mercy and asked that god will intervene so the week that followed when we called uh, my partner called around tuesday but the the father had the, the man had not yet heard from his son so we just kept on praying but before that week could run to an end he was able to hear from his son and the son was fine actually the son's name is fine <laughs> But it's not F-I-N-E, it is F-Y-N-E. So now after that week, we got, after the, the, the last Saturday, we not this Saturday, not yesterday, the last Saturday we left, he got a call from his child. 
that his son, that they were posted to one place for duty, about seven of them. On their way to that place, the car had accident. One person died and was taken to the mortuary. Five people, there were seven. Five people were injured terribly and had to be hospitalized. He was the only person that came out from the car without a scratch. Meanwhile, the car some assaulted. And as if that was not enough, the next Saturday, because since he was the only person that survived, they had to, he had to go back to where their main office is. So, and being that they did not get to the duty place to carry out the responsibility, they had to recruit some other guys with him and send them again. On their way again, another accident with a trailer. I think about seven of them still. This one, nobody died, but six people were hospitalized. He's still the only person that came out just with a little scratch on his leg and he's moving about while others are in a bad condition. Now, we are not happy about the condition of others, but I thank God that he preserved this one, which is something that, from what I'm seeing, it has encouraged the faith of this family. Because from that day when we were praying, I was like, oh God, even if there's no reason why you should intervene, just to strengthen the faith of these people, please do it. And I really thank God. I am happy. And he shared a testimony with me. He said I should join him and thank God. So I told him I would testify on his behalf, being that he does not have the ability to come out like this to church. So to God be the glory for that family in Jesus' name. Okay, we'll take Tracy. Good morning, everybody. I'm Tracy Nico, and I want to thank God firstly for the grace, or should I say the for this strike period, firstly, I want to say thank you to God because I stayed at home for eight good months um, and still came, came out of my house, still a disciple of Christ. Hmm. I live with very strange people at home. Um, I'm thanking God. Okay, still under this same testimony, I want to thank God for long suffering Despite living with many obnoxious, obnox, many strange siblings with strange characters. So I have lots of siblings. We are plenty in our house. And um, whenever I go back home, it's something to be able to, to go back home and still be able to tune in, still be able to, to do lo um, so many things you would you would normally have to do as a Christian, pray in the morning, even if it's on your own, read your Bible, just do lots of things that a Christian would normally do. I'm really grateful to God for that. I'm also grateful that um, I was able to, for the courage to be able to tell my mom about meetings. Just, she, she usually listens, she, whenever I'm, I'm tuned in, she's, I usually put the volume, I increase the volume to the loudest, loudest. So she's always listening. So one time, two times, so, so many countless number of times, she would try to ask me, so who is this man? Who is this person? Where is this church? Is this one a new ministry? All those kind of things. I'm grateful that my mom started tuning in I'm grateful that my siblings that used to always tell me that why that I should live life, that why am I behaving like an old woman? Why am I that I should these are my I'm the I'm like the eldest in my house. Now my younger siblings, if you want to if you hear them advising me, hmm, it's okay. These are these are the people that will always that will, I'm just grateful that my siblings, at least some of them, they will listen and they will go like, hmm, this. I like this, your pastor. He's saying something that I've not heard other people say. It's 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 one. It's that's something. That's something because well, that one is another story for another day. Anyways, I'm grateful for hostel food. Yes. So the um the price of things that have really hiked up now is is amazing. But then I'm really grateful to God for hostel food for food at least to be able to afford food 
on Wednesday when we came for the meeting, the Holy Spirit was rebuking me for certain things I did, um, I so for certain things I said and certain th certain things I did when school, when they called off the strike, when we resumed again. So I remember during one of those days when a sister, she's my roommate as well, she came back and I remember I was the one running to her while we were trying to you know, catch up and everything. And I asked her, how much did you bring back? Hope you brought plenty money because now hmm, for people that have big stomach, people will be eating 750 because food now. So, uh, she was like, okay, so how much do you eat? I said, me, I ate 350 because I have small stomach. <laughs> so, so um, what happened was that I, I think it wasn't, I did not do it intentionally, but I was just surprised. Every time you go out to buy food and then you carry your plate and you go like 100 naira rice and the lady is looking at you like, are you just coming into town? <laughs> it's embarrassing, but... <laughs> For you now remember, for the owner said that rice is now 200 and I plate. So I'm grateful that. The funny thing is that even in this season and in this period, I remember calling my dad last last time and he kept on telling, he like, the money they, they usually give me is, the money they give they gave me now is times two of what they would normally give me. So I think the Holy Spirit was rebuking me and I realized that despite the increase in price and everything, that the money you have at hand, your, your, I don't know, but the money you have at hand is, is enough to take care of your needs. Like anyhow it is, he's always, even if they say a plate of food is now 1,500, we'll not stay hungry. That is what we know. So I'm grateful that at least he's, a, he's, he's providing for us. Like we are eating food. I'm grateful. And I'm grateful that the price of food is, 350 a plate for me so that those women too can also see find where and also eat. I'll continue my testimony later. Praise God. Uh, so I also have um, reason to thank God. So I was just remembering um I know that my um, Gottler House memory will, I will type it out properly by God's grace <laughs> and post, but um, in 2017, earlier on, I had come around to Gottler House here and there for retreats, just visit, but I remember that the decision to stay and actually become a member of Gottler House happened just around my birthday in 2017 and it was after my Psalm 139 that was in November 2017 and yeah my birthday is tomorrow and I was just looking back and thanking God for thus far it has been a very interesting experience I thank God for help Generally, I thank God for um, all the processes. Um, at that time, when I, sorry, I did not tell you my name. <laughs> my name is Anebia Tumoka. So, um, at that time in 2017, there was just there were a lot of things going on in my life, and there were a lot of resistances, you know, to my coming. I had some doubts, you know, people were saying, you come to God's like house, you not pass your exams, that man is too intense, he's teaching false doctrine, everybody that goes there, they just to lose their sense, different things. And when you are hearing some of this um, talk from people that you respect and honor and look up to, or in a sense are responsible for you, family and the likes, it can be very difficult to keep going on, but I remember that amongst the things that helped me to keep coming and staying, you know, and subjecting myself to all of the processes that God had planned out was the fruits. I mean, I, I saw a number of my classmates that were just a disaster. And overnight, they were these transformed people. And I, who was formerly more churchy than them, they were now much more spiritual. I'm like, 
what's what's happening here and you know i i saw the fruits too in my life for the during the different times I'll come around. And of course, the Psalm 139 prayers that November, it was dramatic. God yanked me out of a lot of issues. So um, that's, this is a very massive testimony. I, I thank God for the grace to stay. I thank God for the trainings. I thank God constantly for Pastor Ita. He's, he's like... <laughs> the biggest deal like like christianity exemplified you are learning you are seeing it done it's not it's not fake it's not a pretense and god has been very kind so i, I just also want to use this opportunity to encourage us you know it's one day at a time yeah you know, like when I was just realized, oh, five years, oh my God, it looks, I can literally remember the warehouse that day, those days, the retreat at the warehouse and all of that. And looking back, they are like all of these wonderful experiences, the things that God has put me through, is still putting me through the trainings, the lessons, the grace to even also help other people to grow and all of that. So God is very kind to me may his name be praised in jesus name so um we've had um different people share um i believe that we've been tracking um testimonies on healings testimonies on grace to cope with difficult people that is a big deal because if you cannot cope with difficult people you know you can ruin your testimony of christianity right when you have all these crazy outbursts of anger, people will start, <laughs> who is this person that was claiming I, I go to church, you know? And then the testimony on preservation of life and protection. Of course, a brother, you, you emphasize that this safety is for a reason, yeah? This is, this is not just coincidence. This is God intentionally trying to prove a point and be in your face. And then, of course, our sister testified for the grace to stand even while at home and being surrounded by very interesting people. So we have reason to give God thanks, yeah? And this is not all. Many of us, we still have um, things in our minds. You, you recollect, you know that God has been very kind to you. So let's just be on our feet and bless God for these testimonies. He has been very good to us. Thank him for your brethren. Thank him for help. Thank him for surrounding you with people that are also on this journey with you. Thank him that you are not alone. Thank him for the victories that are present in the life of your brethren. Let's just give him thanks. We thank you, Jesus. Esu vrates ke bali brada da basu kate galabada baha ella so vrate gado shabala di sadadaha. We bless your name, Jesus. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that you are available to us. We thank you that you are present. We thank you that you are not just an idea far fetched in books. In, in Christian literature, you have become our reality, and we give you praise. We bless your name, Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. You have been faithful to us. You have been there for us. You've been patient with us. You've taken us through multiple processes. We give you praise, Jesus. Alish kavriat halagado shabala dada elia fatosh ke vele dege la basu vratas ke tale gado shaha la so vrada daga li vrada dada e so vrates ke velo shabala da i so vati gele de bo shi vrata la gado shandas ke la badia sadaha. We bless you, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. Thank you. 
Father, we bless your name. We give honor to you because you deserve it. You give us kindness. You give us love. Our undeservedness. You constantly overlook. Thank you for your kindness. And your patience. Because I help us to learn to walk and manifest your nature also. This is our request. This is our request. Gracious Father, we are asking this morning that we be found pleasing to you. <clears throat> the reason for our existence the reason for our existence. Give us understanding. Help us separate from the things that would destroy our purpose, our purpose and our direction. Help us be delivered from the things that would separate us from your intentions. Majestic one. Faithful is he who promises who also performs. Much grace. Much grace. Much more grace. You say we're sin abounds. Grace much more abounds. We ask for more grace. Where we have cost you pain, sorrow and reduced the things that we ought to bring forth in our delivery the fruit we ought to serve you. We ask that you forgive us. <coughs> And fill it up for your able. We appreciate you. Do more than we ask for, imagine. This morning we are asking that you teach us your ways. Put your hands on us. Heal our minds and our hearts. Change the things that are out of sync. Let there be recalibrations done here. Faithful God. Recalibration. Recalibration. Spirit of truth. Spirit of truth. Spirit of truth. Come talking. Come working here. Thank you. Receive eyes to see and ears to hear. Receive hearts that understand and the mouth to speak plainly. Wherever you are, may the hand of the grace of God be on you now. Let him walk in light. Thank you. Amen. Praise God. You may have your seats. I'm going to ask that most of the people, except you and Usher, just move this way. Okay, so that those who come later stay that way. I don't reduce the distraction cost. Your seats here, too. Gentlemen, move the other way. There's space there. There's someone there.
okay. Now I'm hoping during this second service that we have a question, you can ask it. Even with things that were discussed in the first meeting. So there are things we may have said in the first service that you might like to <clears throat> ask something about. You can write it and pass it. Or you can raise your hand when it's appropriate and just ask it. The book of Matthew, let's read chapter 7, start from verse 6. And then we'll continue from verse 13. Do not give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before swine. If you take from the first meeting and add to this, we saw that we are meant to be holy people. And here we are told by the Lord that holy things should not be given to dogs. which would immediately put a question into our minds. What is a dog? Yes? yes? You think we should find out what dogs are? Yes, sir. Or you thought he meant dog, dog? Now, he's using an example that all the people at that time would understand. They would understand a dog not to be just a physical dog, not at all. I'll give you a few quick examples. First Samuel chapter 17. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 43. Goliath asked David, am I a dog? He said to David, that you come at me with sticks. And the Philistine crushed David by his gods. So here you have a human being saying, he is not a dog. First Samuel 24, verse 14. This is David speaking. And David says, Against whom has the king of Israel come out? He's saying to King Saul, Who, Whom are you pursuing? A dead dog, a flea, like he's speaking and showing you that the word dog can be used symbolically. And he's saying, what am I? I'm nothing. He's referring to himself as a dead dog. Have you come across that verse before? No, I actually want to say that phrase. Have you read before that the scriptures say that it's better to be a living dog than a dead lion? Making the point that a person, now I wasn't writing to dogs, dogs can read, okay? You do understand that, right? You thought he was talking to dogs? And this is the book of Job. Better to be a living dog than a dead, like Ecclesiastes, sorry, 9, verse 4. Say, There is hope, however, for anyone who is among the living. For even a living, live dog is better than a dead lion. Is it clear that he's talking about people? He said anyone who is among the living. 
and he's equating human beings to dogs. Take notes. If a dog is a person, a person that one might look down on, but a person after all. And David was, in summary, saying, please, I am not that relevant. Don't harm me. If you look, At Second Samuel 9, verse 8. And 16, verse 9. All of it, just to make the point that people are referred to as dogs. Something to be kicked. Something to be despised. It's important for this generation because this is a generation that goes on to I mean, the time we are alive, people esteem animals sometimes more than human beings. So we are living in one of those strange times. People esteem animals even more sometimes than a people. All right. Second Samuel 9, it says, My people should bow down and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog like me? This is funny, but this is a son of guess who? A son, my grandson, but... So, like he's, he's from the lineage of Saul. I remember David. Now, who is he talking to? He's talking to David. He's calling himself a dead dog. Remember David had talked to his father, Saul, and said, I'm a dead dog. Why are you pursuing me? Now, his lineage are calling themselves a dead dog before the one they pursue. That's why in this world, watch what you do. You don't know when it will be your turn to be a dog and a dead one. Yes, um, 2 Samuel 16, verse 9. Then Abishai, son of Zeruiah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord, the king? Let me go over and cut off his head. So uh, the guy's name was uh, Shimei, and he was abusing King David when he suffered an usurpation of his throne. When he was deposed by Absalom. And so he says... He calls him a dead dog, all right? So it's abuse. <laughs> it's a belittling. Someone can use it for themselves, but it's just to say, I am not just lowly. I am dead. I, am, I can do no harm. This irrelevant, I'm irrelevant. And if you understand that this is use of dogs, then you should understand why when the Lord says you shouldn't give things to dogs, it's a scenario that speaks of <clears throat> an irrelevant thing. Don't give that which is good to that which is irrelevant. But let's look at it some more. Psalm 22, 22nd Psalm verse 16. verse 16, and then we will look at verse 20. It says, For dogs surround me, a band of evil men encircle me. They have pierced my hands and feet. Is this clear? You know, this was a messianic, this is a messianic psalm speaking about the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus referred to this psalm when he was on the cross. Do you see them say, pierce my hands and feet? They didn't pierce David's hands and feet. It was, he was speaking on behalf of the Lord Jesus. And he calls, who were the dogs? Who were, who were the people surrounding Jesus at his crucifixion? Huh? Jesus' disciples. Where were those ones? They had, they had something they had to pay attention to. Somewhere. They had moved. <laughs> Jesus had said they would scatter. <laughs> they scattered. The only person that came around a bit at that was John and the women. Women were a bit safer in a certain way. They wouldn't bother women. They weren't considered. John was related to the high priest. 
So he was around there. He's a relative. But the rest, Peter and Co. had all run away. Dogs surround me. A band of evil men. So we can clearly see that dogs refer to evildoers. Yes? Evildoers. So not the other reference to dogs was an irrelevant person. Someone that presents no threat. Someone that is of no real consequence. Then th this time, it's um, someone who is evil-minded, unrighteous, doing what is wrong. That's a dog. Those who do wrong. Those who join up. Those Pharisees. The Sanhedrin was there. Don't you know the Sanhedrin was there? The Sanhedrin, the ones who had him sentenced to death. The Jewish, Jewish rulers, they were there. And there was also Roman soldiers who were obeying. I don't think he was referring to the Roman soldiers as much as the leaders. Soldiers were just obeying their orders. That's what they had to do. The ones who made the decision to have him killed is a different group. If you look at verse 20, it says, deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of wild dogs. Cause them wild dogs, okay? You want to understand it more, read the whole chapter. And then he says in Proverbs chapter 26. Proverbs 26 verse 11. As a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. A dog is a fool. The one who repeatedly carries about the same foolishness habitually. So this is it. Who has seen a dog vomit before and eat it up? Good. You were slightly disgusted. You were grossly disgusted. You don't know what disgust means. There might be the one say, what, what does that disgust them? Who has not had the privilege of seeing a dog eat his vomit? Mm, it's obvious. Can you picture something? And then, Lick it up. <laughs> uh, that disgusts you. I wish I could gross you out more. But if only I had video. Don't do it, but I will find video and show you. <coughs> because the scripture says that when you repeat folly, that that's what you're doing. So stop attacking dogs around the world. Look at yourself. Find a mirror. And ask yourself, why do you behave like a dog? You get rid of something bad, then you turn, then you pick it up again. You, 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 your body, you expel that which is not good, and then you take it back up again. In the book of Galatians, Paul called it transgression. Transgression. That which you have thrown away, which you didn't throw it away mistakenly. You threw it away because you have found out it is wrong. This is evil. This relationship is displeasing to God. You ended it. I'm sorry, this is the end. And then you went back with your two hands plus your leg. And brought it back to yourself. Reached out again. To what? To an evil person, to someone that is irrelevant to your walk with God, to your journey. So dog to dog. Yes? No? You look for a dog behaving like a dog. 
if that offends you, you better focus on repenting. And if you're guilty, you better feel bad. Sometimes God's children behave like dogs. Now, you're not the definition of a dog, but we have been known to do things we shouldn't do. To touch things that we dropped. To re-embrace that which we pushed away. We have been known to not know times and seasons or act as intelligently or wisely as we should. Why must we understand this? Because this is the exact opposite of being holy. Separate. We threw up something. It left your system. It came out of you. You separated from it. As long as food is in you, it's in you. When you throw up, it's supposed to stay out. Even if something else comes into you, it will be something else. Not, not that which you got rid of. That's disgusting. Should we look at Galatians? Said so if we do this, we have become transgressors. We shouldn't be transgressors. We shouldn't pick up that which we've gotten rid of. If we do that. It's not just hypocritical, it's the very thing that you condemn. I'm trying to keep it short, but um, We can read from, yeah, if we read just one verse, that would be nice. But before we get to verse 18, let's read. Verse 17. It says, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister, the servant of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. What is this he's building again? Who destroyed it? He destroyed it. Who is building it again? In other words, that there are things you should destroy. Do you agree? Yes. You read the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Let's look at it briefly. There are things that are meant to be destroyed. It's God's will that some things be destroyed. Anyone that tells you, when you come to Jesus... You still have all you had before, but only better is <coughs> lying to you. Anyone that tells you that everything you have, it's okay to have it. It's not true. And I have to hurry back to Matthew 7 so you can understand. It's not true. One of the greatest regrets people will have on the day of judgment, even if you're generally approved, if you look at the book of Luke chapter 12, it says people will be disciplined when the law comes. It says some people will be disciplined a lot. Some will be disciplined a little. Because uh, the thinking is often, oh, it's either heaven or hell, that's it. We forget the discipline. 
There are people that will go to heaven, but you'll be disciplined first. It's scriptural. There will be discipline for how you lived. The mindset that says, no, no, how you live doesn't matter. The main thing is, will you make heaven? It's a wrong idea. And God give me the grace to keep emphasizing it. When you have believed error for so long, they've told you certain things about people for so long. And then you have experience and it is not as you were told. It is best such things happen here now. It is not best you wait till you see the Lord. Then you discover that you, the whole, so many foundations of your belief system were wrong. And you have the Lord. You, you stand in front of the Lord like maybe we'll see in Matthew 7. And someone stands before the Lord and says, in your name I did this. And is happy and boasting. And the Lord says, I never knew you. It, it is not anything, any one of us should take lightly. You, you, you don't want to be shocked horribly. You, you, you want to hear, you, you didn't do what I wanted or fully. You, you only did 50%. Eh? And you knew I wanted you to do the other one. Oh yeah, come. I'm going to discipline you. Luke 12. Again, someone doesn't know. Please, Luke 12, going from verse 44. So, <clears throat> look at what it says. Truly I tell you, he will put me in charge. Okay, 45. Look at this. Keep going. But suppose that servant says in his heart, my master will be a long time in coming. And he begins to beat the men servants and maid servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. This is a servant of God. The master of that servant will come on a day he does not expect. At, and at an hour he does not anticipate. Then he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. Now watch. That servant who knows his master's will, but does not get ready. See, these are the words of scripture. It's called getting ready. The mindset that says, no, once you're justified, you're fine. That's not what Jesus said. This is Jesus speaking directly. He, he calls it getting ready. What I said in the first service about justification, that is you qualifying, being accepted in the beloved. Then thereafter, you get ready. You don't get ready to be justified. I'm not saying you can't prepare your heart to give your heart to Jesus. I'm saying the getting ready is not to go to heaven. The getting ready, you get ready to meet your Lord. That's sanctification. He calls it getting ready. The servant, the ma servant who knew his master's will, but didn't get ready. For what? I'm saved. I'm washed by the blood. No, that's not what Jesus says. Jesus saves you and washes you by the blood. So you start getting ready. You're not getting ready to have your sins forgiven. You're getting ready to be judged. And to enter the next age. Which has been stressed. Is not meant to play out in heaven according to clear scripture i like to say it's clear scripture because people think uh, 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 what interpretation are you using N no interpretation at all not plain you know there are things you need to interpret this one there's no interpretation the way it's just written bah, on top you know how something's on top then there are things you have to bring out you don't bring out from scripture that it's not heaven that the future is in. There's no bringing out. It's on top. You know, and that part bothers me a lot because you know how you hear something, but you never look at it yourself. Now, when you bother to even look at the Bible, just on top, just look at the disciples asking Jesus every time about the future. Every time he says, when I come back and I'll set up, it's obvious it's on earth. Every time. It's, it's not sometimes say, you know, uh, when I, you know, when you people come and join me. There's no joining. It is clear he's coming. That's what I mean by saying it's on top. It's not, there's no deep rema. We dig out, bring it out from under the cupboard of God's revelation container. Have you seen what I'm showing you? It is obvious. 
And what should this do to you? It should make you significantly driven to read your Bible and pray for God to open your eyes while you read it. How can something be so plain? But for endless centuries, we go around telling everyone, you know, if you're going to make heaven, I keep, I like to clarify, if you do die now, you're a child of God, you do go to heaven and wait, but it's obvious, heaven is for waiting, not for living. Paul was very clear, you look at 2 Corinthians, in chapter, the fourth chapter, and he continues the line of thought into the fifth, and he says that there's a heavenly body waiting for you. He calls it a tent, a tabernacle. He says it is in heaven, that you are, it's waiting for you in heaven. In, and it's clear, it will come from heaven and clothe you. You look at the book of Revelation, it's so clear. It says the heavenly Jerusalem comes out of heaven. To where? Outer space. I'm just giving you a few examples of things that are so clear. Then you look around and the generality of my brethren worldwide for millennia. Go around saying, you know, I have a lasting home. All I took from that when I got to understand these things many years ago was, if we can make mistakes about things that are so clear, can you guess what we have done with the ones that are not clear? Or is this too heavy for your brain? Can you imagine what we have done with unclear things? There are things that are hard to be understood, yes? Then there are things that are not hard to be understood at all. Everyone, Jesus rose from the dead. His disciples gathered around and said, Master, will you at this time restore, restore the kingdom to Israel? Did it sound like he was talking about, they, like they were talking about going anywhere? They all knew that the kingdom would be revealed on earth. All Jews knew it. There's no Jew that didn't know, they, except the Sadducees. Wow, those guys had issues. <laughs> Ooh, <shut. laughs> you know, the Bible says the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. They believe when you die, you're gone. And Jesus answered them one of those times. You know, that's one of those times the Pharisees liked Jesus. Because the Pharisees believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees did not say, no, no, once it's over, it's over. <laughs> Jesus often blasted the Pharisees, but Jesus would tell the truth. And he said, if there's no resurrection, how come the Bible says he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He didn't say he was. He said he is. Can you imagine all his argument resting on the word is? <laughs> you didn't see that. <laughs> and they were honest enough not to argue. Nowadays, people are so dishonest, they will argue. The Sadducees kept quiet. The Bible says he said that and they kept quiet and left and didn't ask him any other question. In fact, they didn't even ask him about that matter. He was just on a roll. So he turned. They were around him. So he addressed this matter, addressed that matter, and said, by the way, this matter, whether this resurrection or not, have you ever considered that he says, I am the God of Abraham? Where is Abraham? I thought he was dead. Jesus argued it like that. They were honest enough to not argue. Today, people are so dishonest. You show them something plain. It's plain. They'll dispute it is why most people, if you look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, will bow to the beast. The scriptures say in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that because they do not have a love for the truth, God will hand them over to a strong delusion that they might believe a lie. So I'm constantly challenging everyone. When you see something and it's true, don't dispute it, or you might be handed over to something. A strong delusion is not something you fight. Um, a strong delusion is... I don't know if you've seen someone crazy before. So, seen them on the road. The other day I was driving on the road, and I saw someone, and he's walking very fast. This, how he was walking, I thought, well, maybe he's just going somewhere. He was walking straight like a human being. You can, people walk like that. Maybe it's going to rain or something. Or they are rushing somewhere. But there's a way he went. Until he stopped in the middle of the road. At nobody.
Now you are saying he's crazy. Define crazy. He's seeing things you're not seeing. He's hearing things you're not hearing. That is a delusion. He's delusional. You remember when you had malaria and you saw things? You remember that malaria where you see things where, where, where life, things are different from reality. Where your mother walks in and you say, Auntie, Auntie, where is Mama? And they say, Kai, bring, 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 bring a cold tower. <laughs> they start attending to you. All right, so delusions look real. And there's a spirit. No, give it to me in Second Testament 2, please. For those writing, it's only for you again. We have to put some of these things so that you can see. The Bible says, no, start from verse 9. <laughs> the coming of the lawless one will be accompanied by the walking of Satan with every kind of power, sign, and false wonder, and with every wicked deception directed against those who are perishing because they refused the love of the truth that would have saved them. Verse 11. For this reason, God will send them a powerful delusion so that they believe the lie. Do you see this? This is horrible. You don't want this happening to you ever. So the, the way a delusion works is you believe in a lie. And this is already happening to so many. Many of you, it happened to you before. But God showed you mercy. Why do you, why do you think we constantly pray for God to open people's eyes? And why you, when you pray for those you love, pray for anyone you're preaching to. Always ask, this is the prayer to pray. Not this overemphasis on protection. Oh, God protect. Oh, God. Every spirit of accident. Oh, God. What's the use of being alive and worshiping the beast? Is it not better you died now? Before the Antichrist comes and you, and you pledge allegiance. What's all this big deal on living, living, living? You're alive. To do what? To cause problems? To accumulate flogging? You know, we are going back to Luke 12 now. Point is this. If you are alive, be alive in reality. Be alive to reality. That's the word. Reality is truth. Aletheia in the Greek, it, it, it means that which is certain, that which is sure, that which is, which is. Is it here? Am I touching it? Okay. This is reality. It's the truth. But when what you believe in is figments of your imagination, things that the enemy throws at you, and you say, do you know? Do you know everybody? Doesn't matter how you live. No matter what you're worshiping, doesn't matter what you do. As you die, everybody goes to heaven. Everybody, I'm telling you, that's universalism and that's a lie. But if you believe it, you do what you like. You live how you like. Why should we bother? Why do we try? Why should we return good for evil done to us when it doesn't matter what we do? <laughs> Why marry one wife? For what? Two wives are better than one. Like only in one place for physical pleasure or in any other way. <laughs> Sorry. You go, you become like Solomon. You just go, vanity. Vanity. Oh, it's vanity. That's for marrying 1,000 women. When Solomon concluded his life, he wrote there, there's only one thing that is good. That a man, he married to the wife of his youth. That means the first wife. Full stop. <laughs> Wise man Solomon concluded when he was done. Guys. Stick to your wife. Full stop. Take it from the man who married a thousand. Take it from him. I think he knows what he was saying. You, you may ignore me. Say, leave him. He doesn't know what he's saying. He's afraid of his wife's people. It's fine. <laughs> Is that, if that pleases you. <laughs> but take it from man solo. Who was so rich. <laughs> his wife drove him crazy. <laughs> One thousand women. The guy just so meaningless. <laughs> meaningless. Oh, meaningless. God had told him so. Genesis 1 should have told him. Jesus said in Matthew 9. He said in the beginning it was not so. 
In the beginning, he created them not male and females. Male and female. Male. Are you passing this? Hmm? Female is what? Many or one? One. Singular. Not plural. In the beginning. So all your ideas of, but are you saying God, if I, if I was you, I'll just leave all those questions. You know, all these unnecessary questions people ask. But leave it. Pray for a good spouse. Work on yourself. People like praying for good spouses. May God answer the prayer by making you one. Amen. Amen. Have ideas in your head. I don't know if I can just find a good person. Who is it? Define a good person. And you? And you? No, a good person is someone who does what? Now, that thing you want, work on it hard. Or if you think your spouse might end up doing the opposite, work on enduring it. Work on managing it. So your spouse flings, will fling things around the house. Practice now with your siblings, with your roommates, on picking things without complaining. That's how to practice. That's how to prepare for marriage. You're here, you're prepared for marriage? How? How do you prepare for marriage? By prayer. I don't fail every day. <laughs> Since I was 15, I lift up my soul. You better stop. You know, I, I oh God. <laughs> God bears me witness that <laughs> I am so utterly serious about this. The things you people do in Christianity, the funny ideas you, you take and enthrone. I've told, don't be praying for, you see, on our way back, we are passing all the way back to, no, we were passing through uh, Ecclesiastes 3 first. We are passing on the way. There's a time for everything. Do you hear me? To everything, there's a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. Every. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. How can you uproot? Jesus, Christ, everything is good. No, 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 no. So you want to bring forth, you want good things, you want a good spouse. Let me just, you know, again, somebody for you. For you. This is what you should do in not your spare time, full time. Be praying about you. Father God, make me, prepare me to be a good spouse. How? Fruit of the Spirit. How? Love. Ah, no, I love, I wouldn't marry them if I didn't love them. What you have at the beginning of marriage is not, is not love. Listen. <laughs> okay, I don't want to stress my people. We have very few married people here, but you see that thing you have, it's called chemistry, maybe. If it's there, or it's not, you don't have to have it at will. You see that feeling you feel? That one you felt, some of you felt it when you were 10 years old, with that person around you. All that, just silliness from watching movies or reading books you shouldn't be reading. You know, and some just natural. You always mm -hmm, have ideas. You have funny ideas in your head. It's okay to do that. You're human. But to actually think it's what you build marriage on. That's like thinking because you like cake. You build your house on cake. It will not work. Everybody will die. It will fall on you. To wipe you out. What destroys marriages? Lack of reality. This thing we are calling delusions. You believe a lie. Ah, no. How you know is the person? Leave all those things. Now, how many billions of people have done that thing? Stop. That's not how it's done. Where should you learn? Oh, the books of books. Scriptures. They will teach you. Plus the one who wrote it, the author. He will teach you. He will give you understanding. He will give you Perception, he'll give you precision. He'll tell you this is how it's done. This is where it's done. This is the way, you know, and so on. He will guide you. But what can I tell you from my own experience and even things I knew before, I'm from learning from those that are wise, who have worked with God, who fear God, who love the Lord, and who love their spouse. What you felt at the beginning is called emotions. It's natural. Some of you felt it 10 times before you married. Eh. Since you felt it many times before, that should, that should tell you that thing can come and go. And then even after people marry, once in a while you're around someone in your office, he's so nice, she's so sweet, all that. You felt the same thing. You're married though and you're feeling it. 
So you should marry them. So how can you build your marriage, your life on something that is so... So I repeat, that thing you felt is not love. That's not love. I heard someone say, and he was preaching, and he preached, and he I said, oh, I was in my office, and I, I fell in love with a lady. Not referring to his wife. That is, instead of saying I, I was tempted, say I fell in love, I, was, I had a real problem. Because he was a, a much older man. He doesn't know. He hasn't studied it. Eros, from which you have the word erotic, is the child of Aphrodite, otherwise known as Ishtar, Ashtoreth, just depending on the culture, just demon stuff. Those, you won't find it in the Bible, the word Eros does not occur in the Bible, it's Greek for uh, romantic love, if you may say. You know, and there's a whole generation built on romance, romantic love, romantic feeling. So you build, that's what's in all the movies. It's in all. So you look at that and say, no, look at, and then you start picturing that you would like to have that life. I, I like to stress it to you before you marry, that you should pull down that idol, pull it down, trample on it. You better get rid of it. Because people, so many people all over the world came together because of that. The problem with that glue is that it does not work. It does not glue. It, it's like believing in, in, in a... You take this piece, you take this piece. Oh, I want to fix your book. And then I take some water. Water. I'm putting as I'm putting gum. When it dries, and it won't be long, it will dry. Some people, it dries within two days, some two weeks. Some two years. Then reality says, and then they start saying, I, we are no longer in love. You were never in love. You were in eros. What you needed is called agape. Agape is a completely different matter. You don't even get it from earth. You can't find it. That gum now from above. And you need to keep resupplying. Around two years into your marriage, you need to renew your stock. Another three, after seven years, you should know where to buy it. But there are there people, when I talk like this, you start feeling, I know now this thing, this one, I say, no, 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 no. Let him leave this side. Holiness is his emphasis. Let, let him not talk about marriage. He's, 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 he's weakening people. You will find out I never weaken anyone. Oh, no, I'm a strengthener of Israel. I strengthen people. How I do it is by tearing off your scales. <laughs> let your eyes be open. See, if you pay attention to me and do the things I say, you have a much happier marriage than if you listen to people who tell you funny stories. They say the funniest things that are so unrealistic. And you, because you're not married, you think it's real. You know how the Bible says it's better the one who rebukes. But later on, you'll be appreciated than the one who... Don't ever let anyone tell you that if you're warned about the future of something, it means they are weakening you. If someone tells you, listen, as you have started school, you need to study. Try and make it consistent. Have a timetable. If you don't do that, you may fail. Don't say that's a bad person. That's a good person. The person that says, you admitted, my brother, don't worry, everything will work out. That's your enemy. Open rebuke is better than hidden love. So don't mind people that try to give the impression that they are helping you by lying to you. There's a price to pay for anything good. Marriage is a fantastic thing. The price you pay is high. If you don't believe it, when you leave, you're going to buy a goat and roast. I confused you. Yeah. Go and buy a goat and roast. Who feels like eating goat meat today? Serious. Who would like to eat roasted goat meat? Roasted. Very nice. Good. All right. You like to, Abby? Just like you like to be married, Abby? <laughs> when you leave here, go and buy. Don't they sell goats in you? If you go to Nasarawa, that is the place they sell things. Would they have it? 
How many of you are planning to buy it? How many of you will go and buy it after this meeting? Where are all those hands? Why won't you buy it? Why won't you buy it? The price. The price. Is that not why? Uh, but that's what we do with marriage. You want a happy marriage. You don't want to pay the price. You think. So someone told you, marriage is... Ch-. How much? 20 naira. And you enter with that mindset. You look at the packaging. The guy is fine. The girl is... Mwah. Packaging. Biscuit. No. So I'm loving you by telling you the truth. There's a price to pay. For it to be peaceful, for it to be more joyful with the troubles, seeing that First Corinthians 7 says those who marry will have troubles. It comes like that. How? Because when two human beings are together, there will be trouble. Ask Cain and Abel. When one they are two, ask Adam and Eve. There was only Adam, Abi. And then there was Eve. Whoa, man. Trouble. Cain. Abel. Murder. It's what happens. Human beings. It's the effect of sin. Okay? Uh, for just in case, because someone will say, but you can't do that to us. You started talking about it, you didn't wrap it up. So what you do about marriage? Go and listen to the messages I've shared on marriage. But how do you prepare for it? That was my emphasis. You, you. In that marriage you will be in, you may cause 50% of the problems. You don't understand. I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit. I know. I know. You see, the issue is if it was someone else, or if it was God, or an angel baptized in the Holy Spirit, but it is you baptized in the Holy Spirit. And there's something about you. It doesn't matter what you're baptizing. You. So, so let's work on you. You, you, you. And who will do that? What we discussed in the morning. The vine dresser. The Lord. Allow him through any vessel he'll use to do the work. Learn. Humility. You will learn, 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 learn. Long, long, long before you married. Long, 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 long. For years, you should have been preparing instead of praying for somebody. Praying, God, find them, keep them for me. Make them behave well. No, you you behave well. God, help me behave well. Help me produce fruit. This is why you must have fruit. Of the spirit that your beloved come into your garden. Is that in the book of Song of Solomon? Your beloved is to come into the garden, the garden of the fruit of the spirit you have been planting since. So when he or she acts a certain way, there is peace, not fire for fire. What do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> You didn't plant any peace. You didn't produce it. Say, so, no, no, no. With my so Everybody plants. You hear them when they are in love. They say, no, she's very nice. Very humble lady. You look at them with pity. Right. Oh, I wonder when you wake up. I wonder if you wake up shortly before the wedding. Or is it the wedding night? Or is it the day after? Or is it two weeks later? Putting your best foot forward. You can only do it once in a while. Why? If you always put forward your best foot, you never move. Who can move like this? The other leg that is not the best foot is about to come forward. <laughs> when people marry or they are courting, they always put the best foot forward. That's the only foot you see. You think the person is one-legged? <laughs> <laughs> when you marry, the other leg will show. Bah! You start seeing this leg a lot. For every one of this one, you see, the ring is on. We have said I do. The other one comes out too. You will have and you'll be wondering, where did this come from? <laughs> After we married, he changed. Nobody changed nothing. What you have is what you had. You were blind. That whole concept, love is blind. It's not in the Bible. 
You better not be blind. Your eyes must be open. So you know exactly what you're getting into after you get into it. Everything that is not as bad as you thought, you give thanks for. Are you understanding? You don't understand. When someone scatters things and you come in, the feeling is a feeling of, <laughs> thank God it's not so bad. I heard it was so bad in this other person's zone. I only have to pick three clothes items, items of clothing, only three. I heard that this other person's zone is 17 every day. So, so evil becomes good. Do you understand? You give thanks. Father, thank you. There is only three clothes I'm picking up. Thank you. I thank you. Because if it's 25, you'll waste my pain. Add to pregnancy. It's not easy to bend. <laughs> so someone comes back from work. All those are your ideas of when my husband comes back. <laughs> I'll meet him at the door. You never wonder why your mother never met your father at the door. <laughs> you think they didn't plan to? <laughs> Mom will be different. <laughs> Young people. <sighs> Whenever I call her, no matter what I'm doing, once I hear. Okay. <laughs> One week. That's if you're at home. One week. You do if you do it for one week, come, I'll buy something for you. <laughs> <laughs> Expectations, keep them low, very low. So they, they will always perform above it. So you never be disappointed. That's how you'll be happy. You'll be very happy. Because they will never disappoint you. Expect little. I'm not saying you should go and get, look for low quality. Uh -uh. Pray, let God guide you and direct you. But when you do come to stay, you know, keep it simple. Keep it simple. God will help you. You need God. He needs God. All of you need God together. Everybody, she needs God. If your heart and your mind is in the right place and you allow God to make those decisions, expect some raw material. Don't expect the fruit to be ripe. It'll be green. Some of it, you have to keep it for a while for it to ripen. The circumstances of your life together will help it ripen the good. God allows it. That banana that looks green will be yellow. But you may have to wait. Is this clear? You may have to wait for a good while. You stay, 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 stay. And the day will come where you look at your spouse and go, oh, wow. She's really changed. He has really changed. But not your plan, that thing people do, especially females. They say, no, no, when I marry, he will change. Please, can I tell you, in case you don't read anything, that it never works. Don't ever plan to change someone. And stop reading nonsense novels. Don't read them at all. Wait, when I write a novel about marriage, then you read it. Eh? In between, read your Bible. Don't, don't leave that thing. Leave it. Don't harm yourself. And don't look down on your parents' marriage and go like, hmm? they can't even make a simple thing work. Work. They sent you to school. It's not easy. It's hard. If it wasn't hard, let me give you one reason it's hard. Because the devil attacks it viciously. That's why. The devil, people can be in a relationship, boyfriend, girlfriend, live together, and not, they won't have near to one over 10 of the problems married people have because the devil supports immorality, cohabitation. He doesn't mind. He's happy. You're, you're sinning daily. No problem. So you have less problem. Even if you people have shortcomings, the devil is not attacking it. He's encouraging the immoral relationship. But once you marry... You are doing Ephesians 5. You're reminding him of Christ and the church. That's where the problem begins. So if your spouse, again, this is why people say they changed. Uh, some of it was already there. You just didn't know. After all, the only place you met was restaurant and church. Best dressed state. 
best foot forward. But after you marry, every other state, what's the use? Why do you need to pretend? Huh? So, I encourage people, try and be normal long before. Even if God said, an angel said, this is the one, this is what, fine and good. Don't be fake. Said, Always, why? Because you won't be able to be fake at home. Let people get used to things. Not the one after a wedding day, your face. Every time they saw you, you looked like a sculptor, a Greek sculptor. Your skin was flawless. Till you removed the pancake. And all you had left was onions. <laughs> Not small, like 250. You should have allowed that to be seen long before you married. Hmm? Should have. That's why you shouldn't borrow clothes to go and visit someone you want to know. Don't borrow anything. Use keke. Don't borrow a car. Don't meet someone. Say, oh, I want you to come and know a place. Then you invite them to your friend's place. Meanwhile, you live behind that, your friend's place. Don't do any of that. Be 100% real. Speak normally. <laughs> Here I'm speaking. Speak normally. Talk with them how you talk. Don't switch on the voice. Hello. <laughs> After you come in and leave and say, <laughs> okay, I can't illustrate. Let your brain do the rest. You know, <clears throat> my throat is um, no, but no, and they realize they have this whiny, high pitched voice. You know, and they are wondering where is the person that used to say hello. They find out that you are an Udobon. Everything you used to come with was borrowed. You weren't real. And I don't mean clothing now. I mean you. You were a matched character. You deceived. You thought, no, we have to. No, you shouldn't. That's hypocrisy. It's wrong. You should only, people will already be shocked. All of you, when you get married, your spouse will be shocked. Don't worry. Let's reduce the shock quotient. And so let's keep it low. Hmm? They will be shocked already. I can't give some of the examples running through my head. They will be shocked. So let's keep it low. Only two shocks a day. Why 45? <laughs> you can't cook. No, no. So go and start cooking now. Say, no, I'll learn. I'm planning to do a course. Like six months before I marry or three months. I'm going to. Nobody can eat food that you start preparing three months ahead. You have to start preparing like six, ten years. You should have started cooking for years. Okay, you're here. You don't know how to cook. Especially, and you're a female. Especially. Go and learn how to cook. It's not even a joke. Don't even joke. Of course, except you're a visitor. But even if you're a visitor, if you're my church member, I won't even wed you. And learn how to cook many kinds of food, different ones. You must, or you cause problems. And then you, be, and then, you know how annoying, you know how angry people have been when they hear a woman in the, in the room praying tongues and she can't cook. Do you understand? <laughs> All right, so there's someone here, you're guilty. All right, you know what I'm talking to. So don't joke with this, though. Don't joke with it at all. I will not. Once I ask the question from your spouse, what's the point? She can't cook. Yes. Come and follow your husband and go. Just go. There's no, I'm, there's no discussion. Because some will be angry at this. Meanwhile, it's five other things they are angry at. But this is the one that triggered. But that's not the trigger. The real trigger is behind. He can't cook. Every time he eats, he thinks of home. <laughs> then you wonder, why are we always going to your mother's place? <laughs> Because he wants to eat real food once in a week. And you know, I tell people when you get married, guys, don't go to your mother's place or father. Stay away from your parents for a long while. If you're a parent and you don't like it, go and read your Bible. It says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother. Leave. He said, leave. Leave. Move away. Go away from them for a while. You can visit once in a while. But that thing where, come, oh, I love my mother so much. No, she's the one woman. When a man comes to, whether it, because some will lie, say, my mother is the one woman, but 
What? Yeah, I don't know who your pastor will be. If I'm your pastor, you better we will pause that wedding. Let us deal with this one woman issue. Will you marry her or her? Let's be clear. There are many young men like that. I've addressed this extensively in certain sermons. Very terrible thing. They think it's love. Don't be confused. It's why I tell people, I say it unabashedly. If your parent is here, I'll say it in front of them directly. Don't call your child every day. Your child is how old? Is it because we have phones? Don't call your child every day. You, you cause problems in all of you that talk to your parents every day. You have problems in your marriage just from that. You, because you, you don't know what you're doing every day. Hello, how are you today? They say, oh, and my dad is it. Leave. You will leave. If you said the other passage was for men in Genesis, I'll give you the one in Psalm 45. Verse 10. It says that you should forget your father's house. House. That's relatives, everybody. Does it mean you forget from? No, it means that they can't be. Ah, you put it. Okay, listen, oh daughter, consider and incline your ear to what Pastor Ita is telling you now. Forget your people and your father's house. That's in scripture. She was about to get married. And you, he was telling you how to operate. How are you going to not forget your father's house? So you come. Everything that happens, daddy hears, mommy hears. You will have problems. You must have. And it's your making. Your own hands have destroyed your marriage. Because you didn't have wisdom. In all you're getting, you didn't get understanding. You didn't prepare at all. All you're thinking about is clothes. If I had my way, everybody would wear black. So you stop thinking. Okay, blue. Or brown. Pink is nice for the females. Stop all these things. That's not marriage preparation. I think we're very ridiculous, noting down things, noting down website styles, noting down. Stop all those things. You don't need any of that. That's not marriage. That's a wedding. And it lasts for a few hours. Are you preparing for a wedding? Are you preparing for married life that would maybe longer than your life so far? Even if you marry at 30, are you planning to die at 60? You may live till you're 80 with that person. How long should you prepare? Shouldn't people prepare for important things? Oh, it's very important. No, I cannot joke with my marriage. But you're already joking with it. Learn how to cook, even if you're a man. Because madam may be in the hospital with a baby. Learn how to clean. Be clean. Are you writing? Write. So you say, but he said this and that. He didn't learn how to. Know how to cook. Know how to clean. Male and female. That is be clean. Habitually. Go and listen to the things I've thought about this. Males get your own audios. Females get your own. Not now. If you're writing exams, don't. No, let's not catch you. Mm. Uh, get the series of things on it. You know, all these guys that wear socks that smell. <laughs> don't do any of that. You must know how to. I address that. Go under the past seminar and other things. Know how to. You think it's simple? No, that's why she's irritated. She's acting somehow. Why is she not acting every time? These are smelly socks. Disgusting. <laughs> And you're like, no, now that's how I've always been. That's the point. You can't be like that. You should have learned on your own. You should have thought, always think the rule. Jesus gave it. It's done to others as you want done to you. It's a very simple rule. Would you like to be picking up things you have to hold with your forefinger? <laughs> and look where to put it. Learn simple things, though, that as you remove the socks, you turn it inside out. And you air it immediately. It will, not, it will not stink. It's that simple. I was practicing all these things long before I married. Knowing the kind of socks not to wear. Some people, I don't know if you think you're a cook of feet. Because you create the circumstances for steaming. I don't know. You don't, many people don't think of anything at all. Wear silk socks. Socks that breathe. What I mean is, is yeah, that's what I said. It's, it's not silk socks. Light Wear thick winter socks. Is it winter here? 
take things, wear it, boil your feet tight very well. You always like your legs looking like this. Cook it in sneakers. Then come back, pull them out, boom, boom. Two atomic explosions, the house is defiled. It seems little, but it's a big deal. Is it wiping your feet? Swash, swash, swash. Uh, uh, at the beginning, honey, darling, you've dirty my floor. Or, no, 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 don't come in. Mm, don't dirty my floor. That's at the beginning. When you've quarreled, nobody will be talking to anybody when they are entering. Bra, bro, bra, bra, mud, mud, mud. What do you expect? <coughs> so she, you, already they, they, there's been winter between you. No talk. Then you're doing this on top. You should be lucky they don't poison you. But these are the reasons. Love, that other thing you call love, keeps being stabbed, 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 stabbed. Till all those emotions you used to have in the restaurant have all disappeared. That's where every one of the people you've ever had, most don't tell it, except they are separated. You hear them say, I wonder what I ever saw in him. You haven't heard that phrase before? Yeah. I wonder what I ever saw in her. That is out of the 52 qualities I thought they had. I wonder how I even saw it. Delusions. Because you're not real and you haven't been trained by the spirit of truth. If the spirit of truth is your teacher, he will tell you these things. He told me, Simple things. Don't do that. And I wasn't f trying to get married. I was focusing on being a good Christian. You know your sister is the one that mops the parlor. You don't dirty. You wipe your feet thoroughly. This is your sister. This is not your spouse. You wipe, you wipe, you wipe. You look at it. Is it clean? Look at it. Then you enter. Not not caring. Utterly selfish. Then you think when you marry, you change. You will not. You will just be a source of pain. And by the time they are sitting in front of you and saying, Pastor, is not working. See, who is going? Many of them don't even know. That long list, you, you don't know the list of offenses. You've caused offense so many times. Both sides. Sometimes one side much more than the other. One side can bring 80%, 90% of trouble. Some people do it in timing. It's my, your turn. Bah, the first four years, seven years. Then the woman goes, my turn now. <laughs> If you know how many men, by the time they are 60, it's the wife's turn. Terrible thing. <laughs> Terrible thing. The wife is like, hmm, my turn. And you see unforgiveness, she might go to the lake of fire for it. There are many women. The husband was a tyrant, cheat, wicked being. Now, he's old, weak. The woman's children are grown and on mommy's side. Okay? Get ready. All these men. <laughs> Secure your future. Love their mother. Or you enter one chance. And that's not the reason, but it's one of the reasons. You heard of men dying in their rooms. Old men with big children abroad. Dying. Maybe from malnutrition. From neglect. You're wondering, how is that possible? <laughs> you haven't seen or heard. Who has heard any of these stories before? Horrendous, unbelievable. Her mommy is in Netherlands. She just traveled there from USA. Her next point of call is France. The four children, that's where they are. The only one in Nigeria is in Abuja. That's where she normally stays. Where daddy? Abba. How is he? I don't know. We don't talk. But Oga was Oga around town, having power once upon a time. Backing, everywhere, terrorizing the whole territory, not thinking of the future, coming to his senses very late. All the birds have flown the coop. And here you are now. Reality is coming. Look behind. See, see that thing coming? It's called reality. 
It's about to catch up with you. There are those who say, no, I won't do that. I'll look for one young girl. I'll, one thing or the other. Don't do any of that. Fear God. Love God. Obey God. Simple things. You'll be shocked at how powerful simple things are. And I found out that the best way, just find out God's will and do it. Sometimes it's the woman. Jump you up and down. I'm not talking about the many, many, many that are separated. Separated completely. Lot of unhappiness. Unhappy children. And since unfortunately many young people, I used to read growing up, I thought it was white people that had all these broken families still. About 13 years ago, I began to come across young people from broken families. I, I didn't know it was so bad. I simply didn't know. That's, you know, and many times I'm praying for them. I remember back there in my office, talking to a young person, praying for them, advising them, telling them not to hate their parents. This one is on this side, this is on this side, this one is on both sides, this one no side. Just hate, anger, and running everywhere, looking for love, everywhere, looking for love, looking for love from everybody else, trying to get into a relationship because they feel abandoned, neglected. Very sad. They're real. Now, this is the warning because you might be coming from such a situation and you're like me, it will never happen. Can I advise you not to presume it will not happen? If you approach your own marriage with pride, it will never happen. You likely, you'll be shocked at what is known as a familiar spirit. Spirit, you understand the concept of the sins of the fathers. Things pass. Among the things that will surprise you very much, I am always warning our young people, is that in the future, you'll be so much like your mother as a female. You, including many of the things you hated in her, you have the potential to replicate almost all. Same thing for guys. As you sit there and say, I can never. It's my father. I can never. I wish you die. All those thoughts you had in your heart before you really came to Jesus, before you had thought that that's wrong. You'll be shocked at your ability to replicate what your father was. Don't presume anything. The Bible says in Galatians 6, let those that are taking the fall, you that are spiritual, restore in the spirit of meekness, seeing that you also may be tempted. Just know that anything you look down on people for, you may do it, especially with your parents. Why? Because you saw it. There's something about the human eye and ear and heart that it's like, it's like we are photocopying machines. I don't know why, how someone can hate something so much and repeat it so thoroughly. Your father was a drunkard, used to beat your mother. You grew up, you used to try to protect your mother. You loved your mother. Then you grew up. Do you know how many men do that? Do you know how worldwide become drunkards that beat their wives? But you hated it so much. What happened? Because you sat as judge and sentenced the guilty party in your estimation to this and that from a place of pride. God resists the proud. In other words, you don't have grace from God to overcome that thing because you were proudly assessing it. You didn't go down. And of course, if, especially if you didn't forgive. The Bible says, when you stand to pray, Matthew, uh, Mark 11, 25, forgive. If you don't forgive, your father will not forgive you. If God doesn't forgive you, it means you don't have help. If you don't have help, you repeat it. The demons that worry your parents will worry you too. That thing that pushed him. Leave her. She doesn't love you. Leave her. She's very selfish. She's using you for her family. Leave her. Oh boy, you better enjoy yourself now. As his friend said it. Oh boy, no kill yourself for a woman. No. After they go grow, all their children go take care of them. You, then go abandon you. So if I be you, enjoy life. That's why he'll be running after other girls. Because bad companies give him bad advice. And he's drinking and he doesn't care. He has all these demons telling him stories in his head. Not that some of the things they say may not be true, but still, he shouldn't do it that way. Rather, he should love her to change. He should love his children and they change. And he would, could go on to be a good husband and she could go on to be a good wife. The wife too. Say, all oh, this one you're doing, you're just there. You don't know. The next thing who abandon you, cheat on you. Better grab as much money as you can from him if he has more money. Grab all you can and keep. 
Watch out for you and your family. You know all these people, they are looking out for their own family. Meanwhile, the man may be spending 99% on you. You're still accusing him. So people come with the baggage from where they are coming. If not from physically observing, demonic spirits from that come and try to attack you too. If you haven't learned to fight it with the word of God, the shield of faith, if you haven't learned to fight long, I repeat, long before you got married, you're preparing, you're building up, you're preparing. See, anything at all you have seen in your family, anything, know that you are a very likely candidate to repeat it. That one is guaranteed. Father, mother, I don't care how much you hated it. Doesn't mean anything that you hated it. So it's only God that can help you. Therefore, you must turn to the Lord and go to the word. What is your family known for? Your father is, was very promiscuous. Moving around, you're a guy, you find that you guys tend to be very precise in your study of the word of God on faithfulness, fidelity, and all of that. Keep company with those that are righteous, avoid all such things, or you stumble in those areas too. Same thing could be said for the woman. Or your mother never respected your father. You used to look, you know, she didn't respect him, spoke about him badly, constantly, and all that. I can assure you, your husband could be an angel. You try to treat him like trash till he becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. When he realizes you don't respect him, one day he, he, he'll decide in his mind, this woman, you are rubbish to me too. And he will make no effort. Then you start doing the things that make you say, hey, uh -huh, you see, that's how many men became how they are. The woman came with the mindset that next thing you will, I know you will. Some even say directly, even when the man is not doing it, say, you must be guilty of this. All men are like this. So you force it on him till he says, you know what? There's no need even trying to please you since it's useless. Everyone wants to be rewarded for their effort, but obviously I get punished for my effort. So why make the effort? Then he becomes it. Very many men. That's how they became bad men. I found out when I grew older. When you're younger, especially, every young person takes their mother's side, typically. If you grow older, and because men don't talk much, so you wait till you're around. Maybe if you're 35, your father might talk to you one day. But seeing as your mother has already spoken to you 1,875 times, it's very hard to uproot what mommy has said with one, one, one discussion. You know? When daddy said, uh, come, I and your mother have not had the best relationship. <coughs> when we were younger, and she, he starts talking, he said, when is he talking? He's, he's, he's 70, talking to you now. And likely to a son, not to a daughter. You, the daughter, you're already in her image and after her likeness. No need. Poor husband, you marry because when you marry him, you hear Shege. You show him pepper. All of these things I've just described. The word of God, a relationship with the spirit of truth can save you from it all. Do you want to be saved from this? Huh? Now you see how we left serious talk about dogs and holiness. To talk to people here. They're always here disturbing someone's message. But I always yield to it because God loves you. And if God loves you enough to interrupt a teaching on holiness, to talk about your future, and you still despise it, what you're looking for, that's your problem. Me, I've obeyed. I've told you. You're here. You're online. You're hearing me. You dare not despise it. Take it as specifically as though the Lord said, thus said the Lord and called your name and began to speak to you. God is trying to help you. So I tell many people, say, I want to mind. No, we are looking at the end of this year. We're looking at next year, all that. It is far better you pause and wait and tell your spouse to be, please, let's take, if it is God, eh, please, let us take an extra year. Let's take another 10 months. Let's take another two years and grow more. I'm not ready. If I, if I become like this, it won't work. It is far better you said that. If he says, no, I can never wait. I can assure you when you're married, you'll not wait. Do. When you're married, she will not wait. If she says, no, 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 no. There's somebody else then. You think you're the only one. It means you are just something on their bucket list. 
Hmm? Checklist. Marriage. Check. We too. Tumbo, tumbo. Last calabar. Mini, 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 more. You are. Um, I like that one. She's fair. I like that one. She's fair. I like them fair. fair. So which I tell uh, my spec. You are hardware to somebody, a machine, acquisition, property, phone, a toy. May you never be a toy to someone. May they know they married a human being. And may you prepare like a human being. Get ready. I think that's all I'm really saying. As you grow in the fruit of the spirit, knowing God is the best preparation for marriage. Summary. Not flowers. And not cards. I won't ask you how many of you have seen your father give your mother a card. <laughs> but you've had it in your mind that that's how. What makes a marriage spicy? It's not. They are tiny things. They help. A little here, a little there. But it's like icing on the cake. Sometimes it's not eaten at all. Focus more on the cake. On the person, the character. You work on character. Who did I say you should practice on or practice with? Your siblings, your parents, your roommates, people. I encourage people that live alone a lot, that all their life they stay alone. Uh, may God help you. Will you marry and live separately from your spouse? Say, no, 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 I can never share my room. I can never live with someone. And then even if you leave it, so I want someone that is perfect. <laughs> You're not preparing. You're trying to join the military without training. Purposely put yourself in situations where you feel helpless. Because that's exactly how you feel when you marry sometimes. Helpless. Where will you go? This is my spouse. And they have refused to change this habit. With your roommates, how long did you live together? Even if you shared room from year one, four years, five, it is over. How long will you be married? Five years. So you better prepare, like be deliberate, okay? Like I discussed when I'm talking about scriptures, tell me, I'm always wondering why people don't preach this. Why, why this is not said more? Purposely put yourself with that annoying roommate. By the time you enter marriage, you're a warrior. Your spouse will love you, man. Say, you are the most patient. Wow. How do you do it? You think spouses don't sit down and think, what makes people rekindle their love and love their spouse extra and lay down their lives many times for spouses when they sit down and think about Look at all the things I do. Look at how much they endure me. Not the one that you're fire for fire. True, true. A police squad. Oduma. <laughs> you, you, you are, you are hoping, say no, all you want to do, I, I, I've asked God to help my heart. But when I look at people on their wedding days in pictures and videos, I'm not cynical, but I'm not deluded either. Many times I feel like just saying stop, but I could post it like a video. So you see, you see, you see this thing you're doing. Some are quarreling already. I'm pretending. Why do you pretend? Some are busy posting pictures. I'm married. There are times we took pictures. Me and my wife, we were quarreling. I've never seen your parents take pictures without quarreling. Who has seen your parents quarreling, taking pictures? In the picture, but they're not smiling. Yeah. Very direct, I and mean, there's no female in front. Very direct. Please, let's take this thing. <laughs> you don't even have any pictures in the house. Every time, every time. But you can snap in your office. No, 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 no. Anger, anger, annoyance. That they can even steal for some. Please, stay in one place. <laughs> Snap.
in the life be the senior self. I've told you. Wedding days. One week after, two before wedding pictures. There's nothing you don't do. As though that makes your marriage. Leave all those things. This is what we do. A fake society. Have you seen how many people on social media that they last posted a picture and then committed suicide? So a fake society. How many of you like fake? Fake is bad. It is far better in that picture we are like... <laughs> and then you remember... Let me tell you how it is with me and my wife and all that. If you're more real, eh, when you remember things, you laugh about it later. Do you understand? Yeah. Remember, ah, this day, and your children say, Daddy, Mommy, why was your face like this? And you say, that day your mother was just annoying me. And your mother says, it's him that was annoying me. And then maybe there's even a small, what's that? Minion fight uh, kind of thing. You understand? That's the kind of thing that is enjoyable. They've been married for 25 years, and they say, it was you, it was you, it was you, it was you. And they are playing, talking about it, real. And fake, 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 fake. fake. Don't you know people that smile, fake smile? Their mouth pains them after a while. <laughs> That's right, people like that, you can do it no more. They separate, because my mouth, they pain me. <laughs> pretending, pretending, it's far better you are real. Far better you're real. That your annoyance. Some you express it. When I'm annoyed with my wife, sometimes, or she's annoyed with me, sometimes we express it right there. People are all around wondering, this guy passed or self. <laughs> I'm telling you, those that have been around me have seen it. You know, sometimes I just say, stop, just stop it. Not all uh, I know again, what's the teaching in books? Always present a united front. Lie all the time. Let's put it properly. No. There are times I say it's enough. And she's still talking. I say it's enough. Now what? <laughs> Please, uh, see, this is my wife. See, talk like that. I'm not saying, now again, I know again, ooh, some people right now are like, ooh, yeah. <laughs> That's your problem. Because if we have 10% time trouble. The other 90% is happy. You is 100% trouble and 100% pretending. Me and you, who is happier? With the same, you know, this is day what? No! Let's eat, Joe. Don't finish that fish, Joe. That's long term. Not, not everything, Pre pretending. Hey, look, so everybody was smiling. How many of you have heard of people divorcing and nobody understands how it's possible? Because they went from looking like the, have you heard of perfect couples? Yeah. Where people say, this is my illustration, my example. The next thing you hear, they are no more together. Like when? They were pretending. And among the things that makes them pretend is because you can't speak your mind. You know what happens when you, do you know human beings can do almost anything they can express it? You know what it means to vent? Someone can endure if he can tell you. I don't always like this thing you do. You can't spend money like that. Uh -uh. You must think of other people. Whether they talk back or not, but life goes on. This is the, how many times is that? I think in these last three months, how many times? <laughs> life goes on. Let's pray about this thing. Please, let's pray about it. Father God, we come to you. Please, oh, I mean, I'll pray you, you pray, you repent. Mm. <laughs> Father, I ask that you forgive me for all the times it is my fault. The 10% of the time. <laughs> Finish. You pray. You won't pray. Father God, I thank you for our children. <laughs> but it is far better because you can express your thoughts. White people often broke up for years before we started breaking up more here. Because you know they are very big on acting nice. 
talking nice. While they were so nice, their marriages broke up, and broke up so much more. We are less nice. We are more crude. Yes? No? Yes. Honey, welcome. All that. You know, every time before you leave, you kiss her goodbye. Constantly. Habit. So an appearance. Is it good if it's real? Yes. Very nice. But it's not real. Because he leaves there and goes and has an affair. And come back. She leaves there and an affair it could be anything. Fake. While appearing good. Which do you prefer? Real, authentic, or fake? So we must be balanced. We must have self-control. Express, but don't be 100% fake. You will not be able to endure it. After a while, you're going to say, bye-bye. Go your way. I go. People live in the same house, and they have gone their way for 20 years. They don't sleep in the same room. But I realize that you can... Like your sibling, disagree with someone about something, but go on, I don't know how to say it, go on living at peace. Can I say that? You're living at peace, not fake peace. The one that you're progressing. Your relationship is like a relation, brother-sister relationship. If you don't go from having just a husband-wife relationship to having like a brother, I'm not saying you drop the husband-wife, they must always, in fact, many girls, why you have problems in marriage is because you make it too much brother, sister, or friend. Friend, You must know husband, wife, according to scriptures, not my opinion. Husband, wife is, the closest picture to it is a boss and a worker, a subordinate. Two people in authority, the CEO and the manager. If you understand that, then you likely have a better relationship. How do we say this? First Corinthians 11, it says the man is the head. It's better, he said wife there. There are two words used for woman. It's the one that refers to a wife, not just every woman, not the head of every female. Men are not the head of females that they meet in the street or in their class, or in their workplace. You're not her head. You are the head of your wife, okay? So the man is the head of his wife. Head there means the one that has authority over her. And the comparison there is that the head of the man is Christ. So it's really easy to understand. How should the man live with Christ? That's similar to how a woman should live with her husband. If Christ gives a man a command, he should obey it. So if it's a command and the man says, you can discuss, argue, just like when you're talking with God and dragging. But when the Lord says, this is my final position, so it should be. If your husband says, this is my final position, now you have a problem with him, report him to his head, who is Christ. That's how it works. So you tell his boss to handle him. That's the protocol. But unfortunately, most marriages, the woman tries to relate, say, ah, is this not Kunle that used to beg me? I bet Kunle leave that thing. You've made a mistake. That's not Kunle again. That's your husband, Kunle. There's a very big difference. Do you know I'm older than him? Doesn't mean anything. Did you, did, did you marry him or he married you? He married you. You were married. So you must relate with him thus. If you don't relate with him like that, one day when God, you have to answer before God, you will be on the wrong side of that judgment. You'll be on the wrong side of that judgment. So make sure you're not on the wrong side of judgment. Relate with him like that. Be accountable. That's the whole idea. Are there decisions your boss has made that you don't like? Yes. What did you do? Did you slap him or walk out on him? No. It didn't, even, it didn't occur to you that you can do that. You stayed in the company. Yes. Good. I think, I think many females try and walk before you marry. Walk briefly. Walk under a bus. So you can take the lessons from there. Take the lessons from there. And um, remember it in marriage. So you can talk, dispute, argue, just like in a board meeting. 
But when your the CEO says, "All right, well, my decision is." Uh, Thank you for your contributions. My decision is this. There's no more talk. You, you don't go on talking. The average woman has no clue of this and does the exact opposite, which makes many, many females very guilty. Your boss goes ahead with that decision. It costs the company 3.8 million naira down the drain. You didn't leave the company because of it. You stayed on. You still called him sir in the morning and carried his suitcase. The average woman asked like, no, if you don't deserve my respect for not listening to me, I will not show you respect. There's no time you are permitted to do that. Passage, 1 Peter 3, from verse 1 to 7. Tells you about, don't open it. Tells you about how Sarah called Abraham, Lord. Go and read it. If you haven't read this thing, you should know it. You're female. For the guys, well, I've said what I do have to say, male and female. I'm not trying to teach on marriage. I'm just saying this is an example of holy behavior, separate behavior, different from the behavior of the nations around. You dare not make that mistake people make and say, eh, but no, this thing you're saying is not for the modern day woman. You will find out about modern day misery, whether it's different from old time misery. You'll be a miserable person. You know, and you would have created a lot of that yourself. And worse than that, when you stand before the Lord, he will ask you, but I said, this is how you should operate. Forget what your spouse said. I said, I said, husbands, love your wife. I said, women, respect your husband. I said it. What does it matter that this and that? You should have done what I said. When you disobeyed me, it was me you were sinning against. Is this clear? I hope you understand these things. Let's finish this. I, I think I have to answer questions. So let's let's hurry through. We read verse 6. Yes, of Matthew 7, right? Yes? And it said, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not give dogs what is holy. The word sacred is holy. It's the same word. It says don't give it to dogs. And we looked at what dogs are. Okay? Do you know what I just did? These things I just shared? If you're a dog and I gave you this information, you will do what dogs do here. They trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. They turn and attack the person that said it. So once in a while you read an article in something and someone says, Pastor, this said this, and they attack the person. That person attacking, that's a dog. According to scripture, according to Jesus. Don't throw your pearls before swine. Pearls of wisdom. Pearls of knowledge. When you throw it down to people, who fall into the class of what? We saw three understandings of a dog so far. What was the first? N not hearing you. People that are not relevant to your circumstances. Two, evil doers. Those who do evil. And number three, foolish people tend to be ignorant and all that. They don't know much. You don't take that which is precious and placed before them. They don't know how to handle precious stuff. It's the way it is. They are going to need more than what you've given them so far. Now, the Lord Jesus said in Matthew 15, verse 26, I know people have tried to explain it away. I don't know why people always try to explain things away. Matthew 15, 26 to 27. <clears throat> And then we read Mark 7, 27, 28. It's the same thing. But I want the different expressions. But Jesus replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And this was a gentle woman. It wasn't time to give 
for them to experience Jesus. It was time for the Jews, the lordship of the house of Israel. And she says, and, and, and Jesus illustrates that it's not right to take that which is for some people, like a proverb, and give to those that it is not for. But the, the example, the picture, symbolism there is of a dog and children's food. And the woman answers, and Jesus says she has great faith. That yes, but sometimes the crumbs, the little, the fragments of what is for some people, even others can enjoy. So in this instance, a dog would be those who it is not, again, similar to the irrelevant category, it is not their portion to have. It's not for them. And this would be an example. Bread would be an example of something precious. And she's saying it's not for me to take deliverance and healing from uh, demonic oppression. That's what was being healed here. That's, many of you have heard the phrase, you know, um, uh, healing is a children's bread. This is it. There's no verse like that. There's no verse like that in the Bible. Okay, this is where that concept is taken from. So the healing here was healing from demonic oppression. And you're saying it's for the children. And the woman is saying even a dog can pick up the leftovers from the children. All right? So, again, the use of the word dog. And the Mark 7, 27, 28 expression says, first, let the children have their feel, he said. For it, so you see first, that whole thing about uh, timing, Ecclesiastes 3, the thing about timing. said, so first, let the children have their feel. For it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. So it is firstly for the children. You got that point earlier. First the Jews, then the Greeks. That is what the book of Romans chapter 1 verse 17 says. First the, to the Jews and then to the Greeks. First the Jews and then the Greeks. God has that protocol, which um, we may reference in the first service. No, there's an order. So sometimes a dog is the one whom it is not yet time for. Do you understand? That, that keeps keeping it simple, right? Those which is not yet time for. I'm going to, I have to end with this to finally prove to you that dogs are human beings. Philippians 3 2 and Revelation 22 15. Philippians 3 2. Watch out for those dogs, those walkers of evil. Those mutilators of the flesh. It couldn't be more specific, right? Very direct. Do you agree? It's not talking about dogs. It's talking about people. Very direct. This is the Apostle Paul. He's referring to human beings and calling them dogs. He says you should watch out for them. King James says, beware of dogs. You've seen it outside the gate? It's there. It's exactly like that in King James. Beware of dogs. <laughs> All right. So that's what it was. You didn't know you were reading the Bible. <laughs> Beware of dogs. So dogs are dangerous. And uh, God wants you to avoid them. So if you are friends with dogs and you think being friends with dogs is a sign of love, you're not serious. God said you should be aware of dogs. So any human being that is utterly relevant, just a distraction to you, that practices evil and that is foolish, can mislead you. Don't keep company, whether it is online, all of you that, you, whatever, wherever you got your ideas from, see, this, we are discussing holiness, sanctification. There's a process. The separation will be painful. Don't think it won't be. But if you don't do it, you will be like a dog. Beware of people that go back to their vomits. Did you write down that one? Even though that's the same as evil. People who keep going back to the wrong thing, they will drag you with them. You will join. Unwittingly, you will join. Because you didn't learn to obey the Lord. You felt it was okay. You see someone that goes back, does something, and you agree we won't do it again. We both of us, we gave our life to Christ last week. And then the person keeps going back there. We say, but we said we won't go, we won't go out again to Tungbo. Now, we said we won't you know, do uh, Yahoo again now. Block these numbers. Break this. A brother was telling me how when he got born again, 
He didn't just break the SIM card because he felt, you don't know if this thing will, someone will find a way and join it and say, is this your SIM card? I found it. Because he was a bad boy, he knew. So he took the SIM card and went to a river and threw it inside. That's how much he was trying to separate his past life from his future life. That's the effort he went to. He didn't just break the SIM, he broke it and traveled. That's the level of seriousness. When, you know, in this house, we would tell people, you came out with bad relationships and old flame, all of that. Break away. Send a message. I am now with Jesus. No more of this. I pray you find him too. If you're interested in talking to someone, here's a phone number. You send a leader's phone number from the church group. Something. Bye-bye. Please, I... Rather, we don't maintain contact. Many people will say, how can you say that? The slightly annoying thing about the people that say, how can you say that? I, I, they are the ones who go back to their vomit over and over again. And then they have the audacity to say, that someone somewhere is going to say, no, 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 no. Why the extreme measures? Oh, the extreme measures are to avoid licking your vomit. And all I expect as a response is, no, nobody does that. And I can assure you, almost 99% of people do that. They go back to their vomit. Very normal. If they don't tell you, they tell me. They tell us. They tell the pastoral staff. Over and over again. So the wise thing to do is, for your sake. And we have seen many, many people able to grow fast and survive and continue in God. By separation, there's the price to pay. Don't be like a dog. There's a price to pay. Those who, who don't want to pay the price for sanctification, you end up unsanctified. And those consequences are not consequences you look forward to. You can't possibly look forward to the consequences of despising the sanctification process. You tell them, please, I need to grow. I need to know the Lord. Bye-bye. No unnecessary explanation, nothing. Just goodbye. Are uh, you saying me, me? Just leave it. I want to come to that church. I've given you a number. Block, delete. Ah, no, 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 no. I can't do that. We children here. You know. Number one, you are a child. You just got born again. You're just starting to know God. You are an absolute child. You're not a child. You're a baby. An infant. Very tiny. That's what you are spiritually. I don't care if you're 50 years old. You're an absolute child. Recognize what you are. Don't drag. <laughs> I don't understand. It's not because I came out now to pray. I, I've been in church since. <laughs> you don't understand. It doesn't matter how long you think you've been in church. You didn't know anything. I knew some things. Yes, some things. But obviously, you didn't know the real important things. The mere fact that you are living an, in an immoral relationship, whether it's mentally immoral or physically immoral, you are off. You knew all this and you were this messed up. Don't you know what? Did I give you the last passage? Let me show you the consequences. Revelation 22 verse 15 of not paying attention. But outside are the dogs. Is God saying there will be dogs outside the kingdom of God? What are dogs? Are these physical dogs? No dogs allowed into the coming age? No. The sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. These are the companions of dogs. So definitely dogs are people. There are people who are displeasing to God, breaking the commandments of God. And the Bible says they will be outside. From this, we are absolutely sure we don't want to be dogs. These are people that are shut out from the kingdom of God. They are shut out. There's no way you want to be in the company of murderers, of evil dwarfs. But people will be in that company because that's the company, company they are in now, in this age. What you're doing in this age will continue, except you repent. 
we must change our thinking. Repent means change your thinking. It's not just what you do the day you gave your life to Jesus. To repent means to change your thinking about life, about how you live, about what you do, about where you go, about who you keep company with. So there are people here, your struggle has been at, as a result of the company you've been keeping. And the words you have heard this morning are to help you make the right decision. Okay? Don't think too hard here. Listen to me while you're here. And don't think too hard and too long. May you learn to be the Christian that just makes decisions. But if you, if you know, I have seen it. And you know, I see people come over the years. Two people come at the same time. Then you watch one sprout and blossom and fruit. Then you watch the other stunted plant. I've seen this so many times. If, if, if there was a way I could record it on video and be running a narration, show you real videos of real people in this, my small, uh, small congregation, and you see the power of obedience, the difference, nobody would be thinking. You wouldn't even be wasting time. I've seen those who, who they, they, you tell them, cut down this thing. They turn around, they can't find a knife to cut it. They use their teeth and bite it. Like, they are not even wasting time. Quack, quack, quack. That's like five boyfriends. Just at once. Boo, bah. Block. Some, while I'm preaching, I, I mean, I had people, weird people like this. I'm not even sure I was like that. Maybe I was. Maybe I am. But I admire them. Because some, while you're talking... While you're preaching, brah, brah. you're wondering what you're doing. Your phone. Why are you holding your phone? See, I was deleting numbers. Like as you're talking, all this thing. Some people spend six months moving like a snake that ate a big lunch. Have you seen a snake that swallowed a big thing? You know, it stays in one place many times. It stays. It all drags itself slowly. Some people have finished before they leave the building. They have finished obeying. Then there's this other group. Mini, 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 mo. Catch a tiger, bites too. If it hollers, let it go. Mm. Mm. Okay, I pick one. One. That's A. We'll continue till we get to Z. That's one decision. Three years later. Five years later, they are not like the same kind of, you won't believe that they came on the same day. They both came out, gave their life to Christ on the same day, called to the Lord or said, I said, if you're here and you're making a decision to be a disciple of Jesus, there's no comparison between them. You think this one has been born again for 15 years and this one has been born again for two weeks. That's the difference. This one is struggling with things. This one was struggling with. Why? My conclusion apart from any other factors, amongst the reasons, is that the ability to make decisions at once with an attitude that says, if I perish, I perish. They won't make any decision. They, they so love themselves and their comfort that they question everything for so long. I mean, the demons just love them. Yeah, because... They don't just drive away demons at once. They keep them around, discuss, table the matter, discuss, ask the demons for their opinion. You think you're talking with your head. A lot of your conversations are not with your head. It's not your head, it's a demon. Demons, demons. That's how demons walk through your thoughts. They say things, you talk back, you answer. Many times, you don't even know you're talking with demons. Spirit entities, they are telling you things. But, but what about... But this person did their nothing. But they will tell, and how you know it's them, they will lie. They will lie. Say, no. Just like they told Eve, no. If you eat it, you will not die. If you remain in that situation, you will not fall. Do you know how many times people come and shop again? <laughs> what happened? You fell again. Wow. You still had the phone number. I thought, did, you didn't delete it. You know how many times you see that? Another person deleted. That was it. Yours truly. 
Someone said she was walking on the road, saw an old flame, ran physically. Oh, yes, you, you're too big to do that. How, how will it appear? Even though I was embarrassed at the idea, like, I say you ran. Yes. I said physically. Ran, like female, took off running. Not because he would do anything. <coughs> But that's how much the person didn't trust themselves. People like that survive. I've seen it many times. They survive. They are the ones with few stories about how they fell. I've seen people get turned to Jesus and have no story. They never have a story about how this happened and that happened. Then some people, they should become journalists. Endless stories. I repeat, the only difference is that these ones, no, they, they act when they hear they act. This other one, when they hear, they ponder. I always say, don't talk with the devil. How did we get into the mess on earth we are in? Oh, somebody talked with Satan. Someone used to talk with God. God may come in the cool of the evening, they will talk. The voice of the Lord will come, they will talk. This one, another voice, whom she knew very well was not God, talked. And she kept talking. You don't talk at all. Wise people do not discuss with Satan. Why? Do you know how old Satan is? Don't talk at all. A skilled orator. He's intelligent. It's because of all this despising of Satan. Don't despise Satan. Don't joke with him at all. He's not a safe being. He has brought down great and mighty people. Oh, for millennia, successfully. Who are you? Don't talk at all. You pull out the words of God, the sword of the spirit, and say, it is written. You hit him with what was said. When he says, ah, if you eat, you say, the Lord said we should not eat. That was all. There was nothing else to say. She said, he said it with me. If you touch him, he said, you know that. She responded. She didn't respond again. She now looked at what Satan said. She looked at it and saw it was good for food. A tree to make one wise, pleasant to the eyes. So she pondered the words of Satan. You never ponder on Satan's words. You ponder on the words of the Lord. This words which I command today shall be in your heart. God's words. Joshua. Meditate upon this word day and night, and you will have good success. A tree planted by a river shall not depart off out of your mouth. My words, you it's only God's words you ponder on. You don't ponder on Satan's words. People ponder on Satan's words all the time. I've heard people, they keep pondering on what the devil says. The devil says something, you sat down and thought about it. I've seen people go mad. I'm pondering on Satan's words. The only reason they went mad is they pondered. Satan talked. You, you analyzed it. You dwelt on it. Do you think those were the words of God? Why do you think? Do they match with scripture? They don't. Why were you thinking about it? Eh, well, you know, I'm trying to be objective. Don't be objective when scripture is involved. Be subjective. That means be a subject. Don't think. Don't analyze God. It's not a safe thing to do. Satan is very good at making people analyze God. Most people that analyze God fall from the faith. Don't analyze God. Believe God. That's how you respond to God. It's called faith. The fruit that it is God is that all things work together for your good. You end up being a peaceful, fruitful life. That's how you know it's God. He said so. He said so. Give me that Matthew 7. Verse 18. Well, let's read 15 to 19 or to 20. Then I'll, I'll answer question. <clears throat> Beware of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Okay, he called them false prophets. What are prophets known for? For bringing words purportedly from God. Okay, so when their mouth opens, it appears good when they are. Mouth opens. Can you keep it at verse 15, please? And be attentive. 
they come to you how? A false prophet comes looking like a brother, a sister, yes? Sheep. But inside, what are they? Wolves. A hungry wolf. A wild wolf. Wolf is in what family? Dogs. Don't you know? Canine. False prophets behave like dogs. Do you understand? They are in the dog family spiritually. They come looking like sheep, but they are dogs. Hmm. I don't know how people follow. <laughs> oh, God, have mercy. I was, someone was talking about how he got involved with fake churches and stuff and how they would do things. Again, some of you know these things firsthand. It's amazing every time I hear it. I, I don't know how people can believe these things, especially if they're even born again. I, I don't know how. The unbeliever, anything goes. That's what they get for not knowing Jesus. And they say, oh, bring drinks, bring biscuit, bring things. Throw it at the altar. Throw it. What does that one represent, Abel? Who knows this one, Abel? Tell me now. That to offer the sacrifice? Huh? To the maker. So they throw things, money too, whatever. They throw things at the altar in They throw things, edible things. And the power was talking, after that they turned, they gave the person school fees, they took all the school fees and gave, because they say bring every denomination, then bring this, then bring that, then bring, oh God, oh God, oh God. Anyways, just bad. A, you see a wolf, hungry wolf, wild dog. You should recognize it. Let's see how Jesus said we should know it. Verse 16. By their fruit, you will recognize them. He didn't say, he didn't say by God revealing it to you. He said by their fruit. Like, don't you think you should study fruit? Observe fruit? Produce fruit? Know how fruit tastes and looks? So when you see someone bring out Fruit that is not fruit, you can know. Good fruit from bad fruit. Jesus was clear. It's by their fruit you will recognize someone who is not speaking for him. And he began to give examples. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears Bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Techno is not talking about leaves. It's talking about fruit. A tree can have leaves and look fruitful, and there's no fruit in it. Is that in the Bible? Did Jesus stand under a tree that had a lot of leaves but had no fruit? So it's not by their leaves you know them. You can look at a tree, and the leaves look bad, but the fruit is good. Do you get it's not by their leaves that you shall know them. It's by their fruit. For you to get their fruit, you have to wait for the season. Yes? Remember, there's a time for every thing. So even with people, you have to wait and watch and wait and pour water and put manure and tend and prune and wait and watch. Then if it's a good tree, after a while, good fruit will come out. Some people, during that waiting time, they say it's a bad tree. Look at it now. And I said this in the morning. I repeat it. I'm always liking to clarify. Don't sit down and look at your life and say, well, me, I can't see the good fruit I'm bringing out. No. You may be bringing out. You may not know how fruit works yet. As an example, are you getting more patient, more kind, more forgiving? Are you obeying instructions more? Are you enduring things more? Uh, no, well, I can't really think so. You know, in fact... People have just been annoying me. We wait. We watch. A plant does not 
go into the ground and three days later it does everything. I know these spiritual fruits and spiritual plants, so it's different from the physical. But the truth is you may be truly a good tree. I've seen many people that have come to be wonderful plantings of the Lord, but they were born again long before and we're not producing good fruit. Very many, the majority of people, I would say, in our main church family, you know, were born again or had given their life to Christ at some point. But we're not producing any fruit and seem to be producing a lot of bad fruit. What is that? Because I know someone want to ask that and it's very confusing. The truth is they were in bad soil, surrounded by weeds, or in rocky soil, you can read Matthew 13 for the parable of the sower. They were in rocky soil. They were in bad soil and all of that. So there, there was, and they had no tending. No one was tending them, pruning them, uh, spraying the plant to be free from blight, from those horrible pests that spoil the fruit and lay eggs in it. That is why they were bad. But the tree itself is a good seed. The original seed that was put in the ground is a very sweet orange. Do you understand? That the plant is not bearing fruit and it has all these spikes and looks anyhow does not mean it is a bad tree. It's the circumstances that are bad. Now, take that plant, uproot it, transplant it, or clear the soil, put manure, tend it, care for it. Whatever comes out of that plant tells you that about the original seed that was planted. Is this clear? Do you hear? Do you understand? So I have seen that so many times. People who I believe had given their lives to Christ, but they were just there, not producing fruit. That is why they say, give them time. Let's take care of them again. Luke 13, let's give them some time again and then see. And what I have seen as a pastor so many times, as by the grace of God, I try to take care of the plants God brings to me. I have seen them produce the most beautiful fruit. The same people, the same people who say I got born again four years ago, eight years ago, and they are, people don't even know they are born again at all. They are exactly like an unbeliever. I either have the choice of saying, give your life to Christ now, sometimes, but sometimes I know they have given according to their understanding. The seed of God is in them, but it has zero care. They will be in church meetings. When you're in a church group, that when you live there, the, the visiting musicians, Try to sleep with you or sleep with you. How, what kind of, well, you see how the guy comes out, hallelujah. We give God the praise. I like everyone to stand to your feet. Let's honor the Lord. Let's honor the Lord. And they go on and perform. Perform. Oh, we bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. Bless you, bless you. Hey, the whole crowd. Your jump is excited. Then they get to the worship session. It's a concert. Oh, let's just bless the Lord from our hearts. Rakatakata keto parita. They go on. Finish. And the other people are all around. God bless you, man. God bless you. And, uh, and he was, ah, and he comes and you, and you bring him food in his hotel room or wherever he stays. He said, fine girl. Come now, don't hurry out. Sit down. Keep me company. And from that, and it's not this, not he didn't fall. This is his life. He did it here, he did it in the other church, he does it in every church. He, this is him. This is not a stumble. This is a, 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 a wolf, a dog. This thing I'm saying, is it real or fake? All over the place. And so I said, well, let's not say anything. But yes, let them kill all of God's sheep. Yeah, that's what shepherds do. You know, like David. When they come, you just kick back and say, hey, hey, yeah, see my sheep. Huh? You run now. Have you heard people say, don't say, well, leave them. Let God judge them. I will judge you. I will shatter your head. Well, just don't come near my sheep. Yes. I would, I, I would stand on the microphone and call your name. Dog. 
You feel like eating meat? Go to the bush. There's meat all over the bush. Why do you pray on sheep? Go and catch a wild rabbit. You don't like what I'm saying? They should eat you. People are very funny. Say, no, no, leave them to God. And God cares about them. He doesn't care about the sheep. God doesn't care about his, his small children. He cares about these, these crooks. Crooks. Deceiving people. God is going to judge a lot of that nonsense in the church. In fact, I feel like praying it again. Every time I pray, judgment happens somewhere. Can I kill some wolves? Yes. Father, expose them. Amen. Father, expose them. Amen. In Aquaibum State, expose them. Amen. In Uyo, expose them. Amen. Father, I beseech you. I stand on behalf of every sincere and true shepherd. Rip off the covering from the wolves on that sheep clothing. Amen. Rip it off. Let all see their fangs. Amen. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 I only prayed for you today. Other days, I pray for Nigeria. So if you want to hear the news, you have to follow a local news. Please, when you get it, tell me. See. Uh, but who do, do we pray about these things? In fact, let this thing be prayer point. Let's be praying consistently. Consistently. Not once in a while. It was one time, in, was it 2019? What year was that? You know, I was preaching and I said, God will judge them. The next day was in the papers. National news exploding. Bam, 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 bam. In the middle of that, there'll be people saying, no, it's false accusation. Which false accusation? That is answered prayer, not false anything. It's because you don't pray. What year was that? One Abuja pastor like this. I prayed on Friday night. On Saturday, the country was ablaze. 280. People be in between say, well, well, that's not why they should. Don't ever run commentary on when a wolf is, is, is caught. They strip off something. If it's your child, they eat. Would you be saying that thing you're saying? Then don't say it. Well, again, maybe I have the may all of you have hearts of shepherds. May you have, you know, David would fight lions and bears for one small animal. What if he dies? So the heart of a, 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 a non-hireling that is shepherd for pay. Shepherds for pay. John 10. They don't care. They are for pay. When the shepherd is not for pay, he would rather die for his sheep than allow the sheep. But you don't touch it. So David, as a small boy, would face lions. Why do you think God loved David so much? He was faithful, exceeding faithful in little. How do you think people will rule and reign in the age to come? By being faithful in what you're told to do in this age. Every one of you be faithful in the little. Example, you have a, a friend that you're helping to know God. You know, new to God. And you're teaching them the things you've learned. You're pushing them along. And then something shows up from the side. Making sounds that sound like grrr, grrr, grrr. You don't say, why is that? I don't want to say anything against it to that sheep that comes here. But I don't know if you notice. Sometimes it seems to have sharp teeth on. And then there's this sound that it does. Grrr, grrr. I've seen it salivating. When it doesn't know I'm looking at it. While looking at you. You don't, why are you wasting time? What is that you're doing? Don't be wasting time. I've seen too many people. We sit down and watch people be destroyed. Too many have been destroyed because of this. Don't waste time. Tell them directly. Oh boy, listen to me. Listen to me. When you fall, you know, you know how, to whom much is given. You better cut away from that place. Don't be going there. Don't go there at all. Hurry, report them. I see people, they keep quiet. Something goes bad, bad, bad. When it happens, disaster occurs. They come and say, uh, actually, you know, I had noticed. They think I'm going to say, eh, eh. Many times I look at people and say, you knew. Who did you tell? Who did you tell? So now blood has been spilled. You have now spoken. You have now spoken. At what cost? We 
We are talking about good trees. Right? But trees are sheep and wolves. Is it clear that these trees here are sheep or wolves? That's a sheep tree, otherwise known as a good tree. Then there's the wolf tree, otherwise known as a bad tree. Are you not seeing it? When you see a wolf tree, trees that eat people, the axe must be laid to the root of such a tree. Do you understand? The axe must be laid. You don't keep the tree and say maybe, well, let's say it won't seem as if I'm the one that killed the tree. So who should kill the tree? Let it stay there and drop poison on your children's head. No, you kill the tree. You beg God to remove that tree. It's not everybody that must be in ministry. You may have started, God sent you. Do you know how many of those people exist that God never even sent? Never. That is, there's no time God called them. They sat down and said, how can we make money? And discuss with their guy. So maybe do church now. And you get money to rent all. I'll raise. You get one of my uncle. Business idea. Start a church. Then you go. And the person learns. Stands in front of a mirror. And learns how to, to sound spiritual. I'm not saying when people preach and get excited. It's from habit. From emotion. It's fine and good. It's not a sin. To, huh, huh. But one reason I don't like. Huh, 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 huh. The man went to uh, the place. Uh, to get God. Uh, uh, it's because you can hide anything under her. Uh, anything can hide it's not I, I mean I get excited but I am saying that I don't encourage anything that makes you an actor I don't want you to be able to hide things I don't want you to be able to be empty you're empty here you don't have what to teach say a good tree uh, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit hallelujah hallelujah and if, what have you said? You don't move on. Say, so you shout loud up. People, amen, amen. amen. That at the end, you, like one of my sisters said, one, one preacher used to go many years ago. She said, yeah, he's coming. Very exciting. Then when, I don't know, I was not looking at her, but <laughs> me, me, I'm always looking, I've been looking for solid food for a long time, years ago. And then she now commented. I don't know who she was commenting to, but inside me, I went like, mm, oh. She said, the only thing is when he finishes, I never, I don't even know what he even said, sir. <laughs> so I was very excited. They say he's coming. Yay. The only thing I, I can never hold on to it, whatever he said. That is, he doesn't say anything that holds, sticks, holds on, that you can carry and go and he goes and transforms you. But she's super excited. Or she was. Super excited. I want us to understand that God wants us to be trees that produce real fruit, okay? God wants us to be real. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, by their fruit, you recognize them. He repeats it. Every wise person, this is how God trained me. You read that passage and you live and go and study fruit. In the Bible, you study trees. You study fruit. You take notes. You pray. You ask God, and then he answers you, begins to show you. You see this tree? That's a good tree. See, Pastor, that's a good tree. How do you know? What are the fruit? Check the people. Check the words. Check this. Check that. Check the behavior. Check the character. Listen to the testimonies. Look, 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 look. If I come and everybody's testifying here, I want to thank God. I counted my first one million. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Just like our pastor says, God bless you, sir. And that. <laughs> and you say these endless things. And that person comes. I'll not be left behind. I'll not be left behind. I counted my first five. The house goes wild. Cheering and clapping. Yeah. And we talk about money, material things. You know, I said, uh, today, brethren, today, I told you it's a day of praise. Everybody talks about cars, houses, money, and all that. Then we go and sit down. And more than half of the people that said those things, that man with the new car, he has, he also had a new girlfriend the day he bought it, you know. Then the other woman with that business, she's cheating on her husband. Or she's not cheating on her husband, she's a thief and a liar. The amount of, the oppression she oppresses her workers, eh? <laughs> You know how they say they swear for someone. 
the the way the evil she does to her workers, an unbeliever has not done it. And then this one, then that one, zero fruit. Then they talk about money. Is that a material things can never be the fruit? If it was so, then Jesus will be known for that. So you study, you learn, you grow in understanding. Jesus said it's by their fruit you would know them. If you don't learn to pay attention, you will join the dogs outside. You will join the dogs outside. And you don't want to join the dogs. You do not want to be amongst those who are pushed out of the camp. Write down Romans 6, verse 21 to 22. Romans 7, verse 4 and 5. Galatians 5, 22, that's the core passage. That's the fruit of the Spirit directly. Ephesians 5, verse 9, I want you to open it from verse 8 to 9. But still write, Philippians 1, verse 11. Colossians 1 verse 6 and verse 10. Finally, Hebrews 13, 15. I'm going to read only two. Go study the rest for yourself. Yes, I gave you one to read for me. Ephesians 5, 8 to 9. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light for the fruit of the light. Remember, we saw the light is Jesus, yes? Consist in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Listen, if that fruit does not have goodness, it's not righteousness and it's not truth. Listen, if there's a lie in it, it is not the fruit of the Spirit. If I have to stand here and tell lies to prove to, if I'm lying, if I have to, it's not the fruit of the spirit, okay? There shouldn't be lies in it, okay? It has to be good. You know, goodness, righteousness, and truth. These are the fruits. Does it result in goodness? Even as a servant of God and all that, I could be doing things, this selfish, personal thing. You're not being good to people. You're not doing the right thing. Righteousness is right, doing the right thing according to God's definition of right, not human. So when God says something is right and you do it, that is righteousness. I know you've been told that it's a gift only. It's not. 1 John 3, 7 says, He that does righteousness is righteous. So you do righteousness, okay? And then, what's the other passage I asked for? Did I give you another? <clears throat> okay, give me Colossians 1, verse 6 to 10. It says... All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing. Just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood the grace of God. Take note, when you truly understand the grace of God, it bears, you begin to, when, do you hear it say truly? So that thing I said about having a number of people that have come here over the years, they came here, gave their life to Jesus here. Then some did not give their lives to Jesus here. But they started being very fruitful here is because they truly began to understand the grace of God. Before that, they simply did not. But as they understood, as they were, you know, that's the only explanation. There's no other explanation. For many of them, it was as though they were just getting born again for the first time. For the absolute first time. Before that, they were born again. Some said they had given their life to Christ 25 times, 40 times. Some say uncountable. That there's no need counting. But what happened? They did not have the things that make them fruitful. And when you don't have that, you're like a useless tree. A plant that brings nothing out. God does not want this. He wants us to be trees that bring forth fruit and life. Okay? All over the world. Keep going. You learned it from Epaphras. 
They learned from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also informed us of your of your love in the spirit. Who also informed us of your love in the spirit. Yes? So God uses people to teach us. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge. So what did the earlier knowledge do for you? It resulted in... What did understanding do for you before? It produced fruit. Are you seeing? Good. So this teaching, understanding must produce goodness, righteousness, truth. Not a big head. Many people want knowledge to have a big head. And I keep telling you, God has been kind to me and taught me many things, given me understanding of many things. But I fully know and therefore constantly preach. I could come any day and share what people like to call Rema, share many things I have not shared before, very many, endless things. I could focus, even today, I could have picked the same passage and extracted mysteries and you start keep going, wow, whoa. But that's not what God is looking for. God is looking for knowledge so you can walk in love. We just read it. You can, you're meant to walk in love. You're meant to do good to people. You're meant to be a source of truth, not to be full of a big head. First Corinthians 8 says that love builds up, knowledge puffs up. Do you know what it means for something to puff up? Usually things are puffed up. The, Perfect picture of a puffed up thing is a balloon. Very big, but empty. Do you understand? God has no interest in empty big things. That's the acting. That's the fakeness. That's the hypocrisy. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't be big on running to God and tell people, oh, did you know? Did you know? You're looking for ways to impress. You're trying to impress them. You're not trying to build them up. If you want to build them up, lay a foundation first. Then build gradually. Pay the price. In the process of laying a foundation, you dig out things. They may shout, no! Leave my theory of lies here. Don't touch this thing. I want to believe that. Who are you to counter what I believe? If you don't dig it out, you can't lay a foundation. So the puffed up appear. You have to pop that balloon. Amongst the things, reasons why we don't just plant, we uproot is that is the space you uprooted that is available for replanting. Who has planted before? You didn't uproot the former yam. You want to plant a new one? Where, please? You must remove the old for the new to come in. Is this clear? God said to Jeremiah, he said, I've appointed you a prophet, not just to plant, he said to uproot and then to plant. We all must have the capacity and the ability to put in and remove. Please, if you don't understand this, you will have, you believe false doctrines. You will believe people, some sincere servants of God, some not sincere. In fact, less and less do I say people are sincere. I used to think people made sincere. Some people, is not, there's no sincerity at all. They are lying and they know it. They ought to know by the fruit. So when you stand and say, listen to me, as a child of God, you can never speak in a way that offends you. Don't offend people. Jesus' name, one of his synonyms, is a rock of offense. What are you talking about? He promised that if you come to him, you must fall. The word offense is the Greek word scandalon. Scandalon is that which causes one to trip, to trip up. It is God's nature to trip up people. Jesus was sent to trip us up. He said, if you fall on me, you'll be broken to pieces. He didn't say if you fall on me, you'll have soft landing. He said you'll be broken to pieces. And then he now said... If you don't want that one, I will fall on you. You'll be crushed to powder. Choose. In either way, there's a breaking. Big pieces or small. That's reality. So you don't go believing a lie. Someone, so if I bring you the true word of God and it doesn't trip you up, it doesn't break some things in your life, it is not the word of God I'm bringing. I'm bringing you a false doctrine. Doctrines that scratch your ear, that make you go, go, go up small, go up small. And you act like a dog. Oh, wow. How prophetic that illustration is. Dogs like their ears itched or scratched. Have you not read it? Didn't, was it not prophesied that men will heap up teachers that will scratch their ears? Who You want your ears scratched? Scratch your own ear. When you come to the present, you want to hear true 
prophetic teaching, sound doctrine, please, it will produce fruit. And that's what we are looking at. He says, from that day, for this reason, I have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Keep going. So that you may walk worthy, you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Listen, fruit is directly connected to knowledge that is put into practice. You want fruit? There must be knowledge with understanding and you must practice it. This is how you become a fruitful tree. Water, you must get rid. Go and look at that Matthew 13, the parable of the sower. He says, you must dig out the stones for that soil to be good soil that will not wither. You must remove the weeds for it to be a fruitful plant. You must not plant on the wayside where the busyness of life, everybody is working on it. You must plant on cleared soil. People, things block are the stones in your heart that don't allow your plants grow and you to become fruitful. So pay the price. Dig up the stones. If you can't dig it up by yourself, call people. Tell people, please, uh, where I've been planting, my heart, there are stones. Help me. What I have seen as a farmer in the vineyard of the Lord is that when you can get rid of the stones, when you can remove the weeds, when you can manure, when you can water and watch, they always do well. I asked this question of myself within the first two years of the second phase of our church group. You know, I started in 2010, you know, God's the house, but paused at a while and we began, you know, between 2014 to 2016 uh, and a half, you know, September I was, I went and joined some other church group, but I came back when God insisted, September or so, 20. 16 we restarted and when we i saw the things that were happening within the first couple of months i wondered is this something that is possible is it some special grace on me or is it can it be replicated anywhere my conclusion after however many years this is six years or so plus is that it can be replicated anywhere if you follow the same principles have you seen the israelites i mean now and different countries where they have turned some wilderness areas into blossoming orchards and, and farms and gardens. Yes, there's skill, there's knowledge. So what knowledge does, it teaches you to be fruitful. You know how. There's a how. It's not magic. There's a how to it. You mark the season. So you're here, you want to be a fruitful tree, or, or even better than that. After you become a fruitful tree, you want to know how to raise fruit, fruitful trees? Truth must be there. Righteousness, goodness. You can't be telling lies. That one is basic. If you have to mix lies to, if you have to say God said things he didn't say, you have to do all those things. I'm sorry. It won't be fruitful because it's built on falsehood. Not just lies you say, but you practice. So you come in front of people and you appear very godly, and put forth an appearance of righteousness, then you go behind and you're practicing deception. You are not the moral picture you've presented. Instead of repenting and changing your inner ways, you keep pretending. There's no way the fruit is not, this has nothing to do with whether people are seeing you or not. The fruit will be bad because the tree, you are not okay. You're deceptive. You're a wolf. So you must deal with the Secret life, if you want to produce righteous fruit. Forget about what people think. The way I speak when I'm preaching is how I speak in my normal life. I'm not two. I'm one. If I speak strongly, in my normal life, I can speak strongly. If I speak gently, I can speak gently. If I feel sorrow while I'm preaching, you know, I'm expressing sorrow. In private, too, I feel all those things. Consist, be the same. No need for acting. If I demonstrate, even in my private life, I walk up and down too. I'm talking with someone, one person alone. Sometimes I stand up and I'm walking while talking, making the point. It's the same. It is a consistent, you have to not, you, you can't do this thing for people. 
He must be doing it for God. Let there be consistency. Let there be insistence. You must continue in well-doing. You don't stop. You must press on. These are the ways that you produce fruit. So I found out that if you teach the same things and follow it up with the same actions and example, people will always be fruitful. So, so many times I have seen that. Except that person is not listening, is not receiving the manure, is not receiving the water, the words of God, is not receiving the correction, the rebuke, the reproof, and the instructions. If they are disregarding, if they've put up an umbrella over themselves, a canopy, and are not receiving what you're, when you put manure, they dig it out. They, they don't like it. You say, everyone, I want us to come out by 6 a.m. We need to seek the Lord. The Lord told us to come aside and seek him. And you say, no. Or you say, no, no, me, I don't do, I don't do, I don't do that. I, I come on Sunday. That, that's it. So those are the ones that don't tend to fruit the same way. Because they are not receiving the same nutrients. Is this clear? I hope it is. We will grow. It, so many questions. All right, I'll say very little about the marriage-related ones because uh, that's not my interest now. If you have a marriage question, mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't even finish. Please, why do people rush into marriage casually? Because most of the time you talk about marriage, it feels so scary. You're asking me. Who told you I rushed into marriage? I didn't rush into marriage. Eh? So ask them. Someone said I should ask you people here, why do you people want to rush into marriage? I won't say much about the marriage and why. I've told you one, go and listen to a message, it's two. Uh, um, we will have sessions, more sessions on marriage, but I've preached a lot on it. I've said lots of things that are different, like what you heard me say today. I suspect you should look at it. If you think it is not scriptural, please feel free to ask the questions you have. I just know that it's slightly different from the po many popular marriage theories. There are those who tell are much more honest about it then there are many who they think not saying you hear what i just said about truth they think not saying the some people so this is what i believe and this person that asked this question has asked it say when you talk about it, it feels scary question when they talked about writing jam did it feel scary to you yes. did you pass it yes. i've answered you so for those in case of our international uh, uh audience you know jam is um, the exa an examination written to act to have admission into the university or the college, college level education, tertiary education. Typically, you write JAM, G A A M B, Joint Admissions Matriculation Board exams. You know, it's a requirement. It's not enough to just write the uh, high school or YEC exams. You know, which is what they write at the end of high school, the American or secondary school. You know, the last class. We have people writing that every single season and passing. And you also have those failing. Yes. It's scary. Why do you write it? It is a common saying, jam will jam you. <laughs> you still write it. I think that's a good example of how you should take marriage. Don't blunder in. How many of you know people that blunder, picked up a book the day before it's Jam to, to read. Who has seen those clowns? I'm not saying it wasn't you. I'm saying who has seen clowns? Listen, I'm not saying it's you either. I'm just saying who has seen the clown who picked up his book one or two days before a jam, jam exam and glanced through and successfully fell? The, the, raise your hand. What are you doing? That's exactly how you should perceive when I talk about marriage. That's why I said you prepare. How many of you know that to pass jam, typically you prepare? You don't just study. You answer past questions over and over again. You test yourself. That's how I prepared for jam in 1995. Second December. I answered past questions back and forth. Marked myself. In between, I'll go and read Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> in the library. I will answer this. I'll go and I say I deserve a treat. I'll read one story. I'll come back, answer again. I did it. I drew up a timetable. I think the Holy Spirit just came on. Just dropped a timetable. Looked at all my past questions. Wrote dates. On this day, I'll answer 50. 
this number of questions, this number of years, three years or four years or five years every day, consistently. That's how I prepare for jam. The highest score in my time was in, in University of Ohio here was 200 and... Ah, it would be 252, something like that. 252. I think one person had that. Two something, something, something. I had 248. Four people had 248. You know, that was the third highest result. You can be assured I didn't cheat. I knew you didn't cheat. The hall I was in, this Uyo High School was very rowdy. We were not living here. We were living in our back. Came from our back. Sat down, wrote the exam. Madness all around. Focus. Wrote my exam. Submitted it. And left. You couldn't accuse me of being this super studious boy. I was not. So don't bother. Eh, you were super studious. I was not. I was prepared. You prepare. So I wrote it once. I was admitted on merit. I feared it. I respect. I woke up every day and went to the library in the back of Abasi Road. Then you go back home every day, consistently, consistently. There's a price you pay. It's what I'm saying. This false doctrine that says, once you're in Jesus, it is done, done, done. Look at them body. You haven't seen anything yet. It was done. You just got that mission, that's all. There's work to do. Don't attend classes. Don't write your exams or your tests. Don't do... They do a continuous assessment. When your mates leave university, you'll be there. Two years, three years later, you are there if they allow you to continue. There's a price to pay. Are you hearing me? Let's not joke. We, we joke with God. So this is marriage you're talking about. Why would you joke with something as important as marriage? I don't blame our father so much. What did they know? Was there as much of the word of God and knowledge as there is now? What's our excuse? Shouldn't you learn from them? Many of their fathers were chiefs. They are married seven wives, ten wives. Won't you learn in this? Look at when you are alive. Shouldn't you be far, far more advanced? Instead, people want to be committing morality, calling love. That's not how to prepare for marriage. You don't have self-control before marriage. I don't trust you. That's why I don't trust anyone to get married that is struggling with immorality. Say, no, if only I marry, I will stop. You're a joke. You will break your spouse's heart. You will cheat on them. You didn't have self-control before. Where will you get it from? In marriage. No, 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 no. no. You better. The, uh, stop quoting 1 Corinthians 7. You are wrong. The Bible says, if a people that are betrothed to each other, let me tell you what 1 Corinthians 7. Who has said it before? I said, if they're born, let them marry. Yeah. And he said, me, if I'm struggling with lust, it means you should marry. The passage is saying for a girl and a guy who were known, they are an item, a couple, is known, parents or whoever, however it was known, this brother is the one I'm marrying. This sister is the one I'm marrying. It's known. So when you see each other, you're shy and all of that, and you talk to each other, and you're burning. That's what leads to the burning. It's not you walking around burning up and down, left and right, wherever you turn. It is that there's a specific person that you are feeling strong feelings for because you are betrothed, because this is your fiancé. He said, rather than keep being fiancés forever, while fire has caught your Clothes. Marry. Have you heard? That's what First Corinthians 7 says. Don't be misquoting scripture. Say, if you walk around like burning, marry. <laughs> you set someone on fire. So, stop burning first. Your fire must be put out. So, if you're there, ah, no, if I can marry, I'll stop. No, you cheat on your spouse. I'm serious. That lack of self-control you have, you have it in the office too. And you think if this, if you think this is a male thing, you don't know anything. I, I, I used to be ignorant like you. <laughs> I don't know if women have not even beaten men now, sir. Even though I don't think anyone can beat me. It's everywhere. Everywhere. Just that women are masters of hiding. So don't joke with it. You must grow. Focus on growing in the spirit. That's all I said. I'm not saying she. I am very happily married. Having a spat with your spouse is not house destroying. Building a life together is a blessing. Two are better than one. The grace of God 
the strength of two coming together to do good is very enjoyable. The intimacy, the other things. All this pastor is saying and teacher is saying is you better prepare. Don't be, don't be, don't do, uh, oh, I can't wait. How many of you will be married before the end of next year? I command on you. You shouldn't be jumping when people, in fact, go and listen to the things I've talked about. Marriage. So that person loves you. He's pushing you into trouble. You should have sat down first and prepared. Ask God when, who, how, and Lord, what? Spend time preparing. Learn, change your character. Not for marriage, for God. When you marry, it is from the character you developed in front of God that your spouse will enjoy. Do you understand? Yes, when they deserve to be shouted at and you gently say, I don't like that thing you did. And just walk away quietly. It's from your relationship with God. Everybody benefits when you love God. Everybody on earth benefits when you're forgiving. Where do you think you get the grace to forgive your spouse? You think they have stepped on your toes yet? See, listen, if you're not married, you don't know what it means to have your toes stepped on. You don't even know the meaning. Roommates that you're saying, don't worry, I believe this year is about to end. With spouse, what compounds it is that you know you can't go anywhere. Do you know what happens to a human's mind when he, you know you can't go anywhere? It's, it's anguish. You look at the future, it is dark. With a roommate, you look at the future and you are free. With a spouse. So that's why people break up violence or resort to violence. You may not resort to violence with your roommate because you tell yourself, Abi, Abi, semester is almost over. But with marriage. So there's this feeling like, what can I do? Therefore, spend time practicing with roommates. Practice with them. That's what I said. I gave you the best advice you can have. Practice. Use your siblings. All of it. I say, I can never endure my siblings. You better practice enduring them. Because they are sent by God to prepare you for your spouse. You think your siblings are annoying. Be wise. Is this clear? Then uh, this at this same hand right here. I'm saying I don't know if this is from an online questioning. <clears throat> Please sign a situation where some disputes arose between a man and his wife, resulting in emotional hurt. Even after they resolve the issue, <laughs> what practical measure can they take to restore their bond and even communication and happiness? You are you married? Whoever is asking this question, you won't face your side. Uche. Face your side, girl. You, so you want me to talk, then you can't go and tell them. <laughs> tell them to come and see me, even though I'm very busy. I'm not sure I have time. But tell them to call me. <laughs> and this question is funny. They had emotional heart. Even after the... There's only one solution. Is it not what I've been saying? It's called forgiveness. See, you don't understand why I say you should find a devil roommate. Why you shouldn't be running when they stress? You must learn to forgive. There's one solution to all marital problems. Oh, I forgot to tell you. You must forgive them. <laughs> you must say, Father, forgive them. Sometimes you have to tell them, have you, told, have you apologized? Pray before you say it, because you may say, apologize for what? You think the knife was deep. They have just pushed it deeper. Ah, Ah, Pastor Ita then came. <laughs> Who sent me? Say, hey, if you do that, they'll trample on you. They'll take you for granted. If you have not yet learned to be taken for granted, don't even marry. Ah, your spouse will take you for granted. You don't understand. Man of God with power for the hour. John Wesley will finish preaching. Oh, matata likata. John Wesley shook the earth. Shook England, talk about power. You'll be preaching, people will be screaming, falling. Short man like this. He will go home. His wife will pour. <laughs> she treat him like trash. Consistently. You ever heard John Wesley's story before? Someone said they walked and saw her dragging him by the hair on the ground. <laughs> the great man of God, he's there talking. 
with people. He breaks into a meeting. You're sleeping. I'm sure you're sleeping with this girl. Raya, Raya. He said to her, say he wrote, he said, if you had a thousand lives, you could never rectify the damage you have done. That is, if you lived and lived and lived again, you couldn't rectify the damage. Now, I'm not saying that's true. I'm just saying that when he comes out, the command, the authority he had at home, that meant nothing. Which is why, again, people should watch how they marry. If you know the story, you may have heard me tell it. You know, you read it by yourself. John Wesley had a woman, they would powerful evangelistic calling she would travel i don't even understand how it is maybe they travel in a group she would travel along all that they had this strong thing but before they married which is why again watch what you say have good counsel have, you better have knowledge and good counsel he and his brother charles wesley the one who wrote most of thousands of hymns you know had said that we will never marry they made a commitment to themselves until we have approval from each other so this woman, who seemed to be a perfect fit for John Wesley, when he told Charles, Charles didn't approve. That's how he didn't marry someone that was perfectly fine with traveling all everywhere to preach. Perfectly fine. Like a perfect team. He left there. He was angry with Charles, amongst other things. When he married this one, he didn't get approval, as far as I know. He, he, now, he was now like, leave me alone. And when they married a widow, woman, which is not wrong, but married a widow woman who had in a hurry, all sorts of things, and he had hell on earth at home. Hell. He couldn't wait not to be at home. And in fact, he was never at home. Now, the other one would have been traveling with him. This one stayed at home. Every time he comes back, he can't wait to take off running. She hated him like this. They hated her so badly, according to the story. Very miserable. Very miserable. That's our great John Wesley of Methodist memory. Decisions. It's not just, you know, preparing. It's even the decision. You end up, it better, it better be God. Now, they couldn't have known everything. That's why I tell our people, whether I like it or not, you better pray about things. It's not about entry. Uh, you, know, you know the stories I've heard? I know people, they say their spouse was trying to kill them actively, not spiritual, actively trying to put them to death, remove them from the earth, erase them. I've known people that have married, and the person married them, man, that married woman, to because she's wealthy, she's, she has some means. He wants to kill her. When you have a spouse that you're not sure if it's them that send armed robbers, what was that? What was that? But people were dancing and eating cake. What are you talking about? Why would I not scare you? And if you know how common this nonsense is, very annoying. Now, how do you walk with crow crow eyes like that into that kind of thing? Someone that is looking at you and saying, idiot. Yes, I'll take all this money. The what about the one that is married already? Or the one that has multiple every example I'm giving, I'm thinking of real people locally or from this state. I'm not even thinking international now. And the fellow has women in multiple states in a foreign country. Women all over. He comes and marries you. 100% coming for your money. 100%. It has nothing to do with they love themselves. You know all this talk about we love, then we didn't, then love deemed. You know the stories I was telling earlier about love cooling. This one, there was never any love. Zero. They zoomed in on you. Said so that's an ATM. I, you can make money from this one. If you break up, you can get something from sharing things. That's the only reason. They, didn't, they never loved you for one second. You were always a tool. What is that? So that one too is marriage. Do you know how many people are entering those things daily? Question, why do you enter such a thing? I, how much might be a Christian? Say, no, it was in church. He was in church. So because he was in church, so what? Someone married someone in this town many years ago. Married them like this. Bah! Joint was in the church, was part of the uh, unit. Everything as they came back from church that day, said, <laughs> hmm. opened a compartment in the wall, brought out hot drink, kept it, said all this thing, church thing. Ends now, eh? I'm a member of a Lumba Abu. Like, 
Can you imagine? They brought you straight from a Pentecostal. Church. Now, again, no, no, hear me. Who pushed me? Don't see. <laughs> the, again, me, I'm asking. So you blind? Your pastor blind? All your church members blind? I tell people, when alarms go off, ping, ping, stop accusing everybody of trying to stand in your way. Some people are trying to save you. They're trying to save you. Someone stands in the road and doing, no, 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 it's a bed. Doesn't know where I'm rushing to. Till you fly over the place there was once a bridge. Then you find out why that person was standing on the road and waving their hands in the rain. It's not hatred. Nobody's trying to slow you down from your destination. There's no destination. It has been removed. There are marriages that it was never to be, ever. Zero approval from heaven. Why do you want such a thing? No, no, you just want to wear a ring. Go and buy a ring, put it on. Walk around like this. Have you heard me? Yes, sir. Do I love you? Yes, sir. I wish you well, oh. I wish you well, oh. I really wish you well, oh. But there are many lions and bears. Let them not be among the things that we even look at. And you, my first emphasis was make sure you two are not a lion or a bear. Is this clear? That's what I said at the beginning. So I'm ending with, uh-huh. First Peter 3, what do, does it mean God wants me to call my husband my Lord? Maybe, yes, maybe for you, whoever asked this question. <laughs> but it's not about calling them. Actually, so the word curious means a master. It means she treated him like a master, okay? You have examples in the Bible. Yes, they're talking about Sarah. It's specific. Say, so called Abraham Lord, all right? So she treated, she obeyed him. Verse 6, First Peter 3, 6. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham and called him Lord. And you are her children if you do what is right and refuse to give way to fear. So why people are afraid? Number one reason women are afraid to act as though they, are, they should obey their husband is they believe you trample all over them. The Bible says it. He knows and says do what is right and don't give way to fear. It's there. Look, I've written there. Now, so the average miserable marriage, many miserable marriages where the man might be good is... Because the woman wants to be equal, and you've heard false, wrong teachings that tell you you're equal. You're not equal. That's like saying, that's like saying your husband is equal to Christ. First Corinthians 11, it's kind of clear. Scriptures don't bash themselves. Don't misquote Ephesians 5.21. It says you should have respect one to another. Yes, even your children you should respect. Respect your maid. Respect everybody. We should respect people. That's not, not just your spouse. You should respect people. You have people in your house. You should respect them. Everyone around you should be respected. The same way those young people in your house should respect you too. You tell them, don't do that. They shouldn't do it. Or if they want to do it, you say, can I do this now? So people disrespect people, young and old. So the Bible says, you should have mutual respect for your spouse. Absolutely. You want to do something, there should be enough respect once in depending on the matter to present it to your spouse. I like to present things to my spouse. I don't just like doing anything. I like to present things. Even the young people that are in my leadership and all that, even the whole church, when I want to make decisions at times, I tell the whole church, I think people should just respect. Respect is not about saying good morning, good afternoon, bowing your head up and down like a male a gamma Lisa. No. Respect is how you esteem people in your consideration. This decision I'm about to make, should they have a say? I would like to hear their opinion. I think that's respect. How can a husband not have that for his wife? But I have seen situations where the husband respects the wife more than the wife respects him by far more. I've seen that in different places. Why should that be? When the Bible commands you to respect him as your head, He's your head as per, I said it earlier, your boss. All right, so that's what it means to call them Lord. You should know and not treat them, that common behavior amongst many wives, especially now, very dangerous. When you stand before the Lord, you'll be very sad because he'll, deal, he'll flog. I never, you never finished the Luke 12. Where he said they'll flog you 
said the one who knew his master's will and didn't do it, that they'll flog you with many blows. Verse 47. The servant who knows his master's will but does not get ready or follow his instructions will be beaten with many blows. This is Jesus talking. It's not Pastor Ita. So you know your master's will. Your master's will is in the scripture. So how should you relate, woman, with your husband as though he's your boss? You may argue with him, but when he says, this is my decision, yield to it. Your behavior, he tells you at the beginning of that passage, should convince him to change. It's your behavior, not your fighting him. You're not meant to fight your husband into submission. You, that's not success. You didn't succeed. You seem to win. Because you're afraid. If I yielded, he would. But you should have prayed to his boss. And waited on the Lord with a meek and quiet spirit and your character. And God can intervene for you. And he will change. So go and read First Peter 3 from verse 1 to 7. All right. Knowing should save you. This is how your knowledge should produce fruit. Do you understand? The fruit, fruit of, for the women here, if you read this, when you read that First Peter 3, it says, meekness, a meek and quiet spirit. He said, it's of great value in God's eyes. It's jewelry in the spirit. You're very fine. You're a fine woman spiritually when you have a meek and quiet spirit. And it's not talking about everywhere. It means with your spouse specifically. But this is a very rare thing because it's not taught, because it's not popular, because the feminist movement a very demonic thing, which, again, I've come across many people that have drank from their waters. Very demonic. If you know what it's rooted in, you don't, look, you don't, take, you don't take something from Jezebel and say, well, it works. <laughs> who did you get that from? From the Bible? You got that from Jezebel, a woman who, who was more powerful than her husband. Her husband wants something, doesn't get it, goes home to sulk. She goes up and kills the person. She... she now she sealed their doom. She destroyed their family. It's always so. The same way if your husband saw this tree, didn't eat it, you came and ate it. You guys don't understand how these things work, right? She didn't say, Adam, can we eat Adam? Let's eat Adam pluck now. She didn't do it through him. She did it directly. She took, she ate first. And then gave him. That alone, that our condition was sealed. If you don't learn from these things, or you still think this is an opinion, I'm sorry. You, you, then who will help you? No, this is the word of God. When she killed Naboth for his vineyard, Elijah showed up. That's the day he told him, Ahab, you don't do, 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 do. They blame Ahab. He said, they, will, they won't be a single male left in your family. If you know the story, they removed 70. He had 70 sons. They removed all their heads and off, kept it in baskets. So do you still think this is a small thing? He said, Jezebel, dogs will eat her and lick her blood in this vineyard when Naboth died. On the day they pushed her from the top, everybody has forgotten this. Thing. They pushed her down years later. And Jehu used his chariot to climb, run her over so she would die properly. Then went in to eat and drink. Then said, That nonsense woman, go and carry her and bury her. She's a king's daughter. They went there, there was nobody. Dogs had finished her. Only the bones, the palm, they were full of food. So they left the palm, the bones. You know, the hand is bony and the feet. That's all that was left. And they remembered the word of the Lord. When was this done? When he, that woman got up, her husband was sulking. She, she was taking action. Don't ever copy Jezebel. She, she would destroy. The fruit is destruction. There's nothing else. God's ways seem weak, but they are powerful. How did Jesus save the whole world? Dying on a cross. What kind of fighting style is that? But look at the world today. Don't struggle. I, was it last Sunday or Wednesday? I shared on the wisdom of God. Wednesday, I think. Don't drag with God's wisdom. Don't even bother. See, when God talks, just say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And run off and go and do it. God's wisdom is, 
is out of this world. His methods are not yours. So follow his methods. Amen? Amen. Call your husband Lord by yielding to him. Except he tells you to sin. Then don't sin. Before you say, I say you should sin. Tell him, no, your boss said I shouldn't do it. But any other thing, do it. I find myself a exhibiting character I have despised in my parents and siblings. I know. After repenting or judging my parents, what else can I do to overcome these things? Nothing. Just ask God to forgive your parents. Make sure you constantly, if they keep doing it, ask God to forgive them. Then submit to them. Be humble. Just normal. You'll be fine. God will see your humility and give you grace not to behave like your parents. Okay? My mother has certain grievances against my father, which are valid. Yes. She loves me very much. So I try to empathize with her pain. <laughs> so your father doesn't love you very much. That's a presumption. You try to empathize. Yeah, the whole thing about taking sides. You know, I have a lot of people here who refuse to take sides and their, their parents on this side or the other hate them for it. Wants them to take sides, to put them out, to speak against the father or the mother. Not one person, multiple in our congregation. These are things I handle. Real things. These are real problems. You have families that hate and attack. Say, why don't you join and speak against your father? Why don't you join and speak against... Well, why do you keep quiet when we are talking? We want you to join in and bash and bash. And that's, a, that's why some people hate me. Without ever meeting me. There are parents who hate me because I taught their children to be different. They want them to be like the whole family. Oh yeah, let's have roast daddy. That's where you roast your daddy. Tear him apart. <laughs> God, your angels don't look on that gathering with smiling. When I try to make excuses for my father, they perceive it as me taking his side and trivializing her pain. What can I do to handle this? Don't even be there. What I used to do when I was in any setting where my relatives are for years, when I was still in living with relatives, whenever I am there, I leave the place. I go to the room. I go to my room. I go somewhere else. Don't place yourself in harm's way. And I didn't used to always put my mouth to defend. I did. I got into an endless trouble. When you want trouble in this world. <laughs> so I formed the habit of not being there. You know? So. You don't just sit there at all. Will they notice? Oh, yes. Will it cause problems? Yes. But when you continue and refuse to change, after a while, they'll leave you alone. And you'll be less tempted to sin. If you insist on joining, putting your mouth, you know you give account for every word you speak, right? To who? Your mother or father? To who? Matthew 12 says to God, one day you give account for every careless word you said. Huh? Instead, be bold enough to write and say, Daddy, mommy said you did this and that and that. Is it true? Or Daddy, it's true that this thing you do. The Bible, pray for them. It's very difficult with parents, <coughs> but you must do it the God way. Can, did you, can you picture Jesus? Did they, hang, they hung Jesus on the cross. Was it right? Was it right? Was he cursing them from the cross? God will punish all of you. <laughs> See this crucify, crucify me. All of you, they will crucify like this. And your children, your children's children, they will crucify all of you. You see this pain? When I didn't do anything, that's not what... See, real Christianity is tough. That's why there's very little of it. Okay? So you have to do the right thing, even though it's hard. I'm sorry. I don't know. I'm apologizing on behalf of God. I'm sorry. Real discipleship. Jesus said, if anyone will come after me, take up your cross. And for me, it's a cross. It's painful. So you mean I should be greeting my father? Yes. You mean I should? Yes. But, ah, do you know what my father has done? Do you know what my mother has done? She left us. Do you know my brother, younger brother was only three and she left us? I'm sorry. You need to deal with it. Talk. It will be painful. Do you know how many tears we've seen in this house over the years? How many times we are praying for someone having deliverance and the demon will not leave until they forgive? Number one way to have demons not live is don't forgive. The number one way to have problems in this world is to not forgive. Believe me. Jesus said, if you don't forgive, my father will not forgive you. I know preachers don't like preaching that passage because it's very hard. How can you not forgive us? You good God. 
He said, I will not forgive you. He even told a story about a king who forgave a man, then went back and locked him up again because he didn't go and forgive someone else. That's exactly how you must treat your parents. There is no other way. And that's what you must tell your parents. Now, so what your parents is doing in this instance, the mother and sometimes the father, they are trying to get you to hate like them and not forgive. All of them, when they die, if they don't repent and they stand before God, that matter will take them to Hades. It is what it is. <laughs> you don't know what he did. You don't understand. Jesus didn't say based on what they did. He said you must forgive. So how you do it is you pray and say, Father, forgive my father. Father, forgive my mother for what they've done. This, that, that, amen. Then he said, Mommy, dad or daddy, whoever is the person you're with. I, I read this. I have learned this. My pastor taught me this. So I have prayed this. Please, I won't. I, I have to do it because that's what God, our God says I should do. That's all. That's all. That's the end. When you're carried away and your mouth says, hey, but what that is, is not good. So, uh, then you remember, stop, leave. Do this and daddy may change. Why? Because God looks and says, have you stopped fighting? Can I intervene now? And he may change. God is the one who changes heart. You too, you were bad. Were you born, born again? You too were bad. They have not seen the light. You that claims to see the light, why are you not different? So let's say, two, do you know how many people have gotten born again when someone obeyed what I just said? And you're there blaming them. A blind person that is in bondage, a prisoner of sin. You're blaming a prisoner why he has not left where he is. Why she has not left where she is. She's a prisoner. She's bound to that situation. And it's their fault. I know. It's their fault that they got in prison. But they are in prison. Did I show on captivity last two weeks? If you went here, go and listen to messages I shared on captivity in the last two weeks ago. Last uh, two days or three. Was it Fridays or so? On captivity. People are in captivity to sin. For them to be free, someone has to help them be free. Is this clear? On the issue of cutting off old flames, what if he's your senior classmate and he keeps calling you to assist with your notes? Do you just turn him down? No, lift him up. <laughs> what is the best way to handle it, especially when he begs and keeps calling? Do you guys want to answer? Huh? Should I answer? There's nothing to answer, bro. If you like, when you wake up in hell one day, you know something. You think you're wiser than everybody. Just leave all those things. Again, I could tell you very many stories. But real stories. People here in our congregation, I know most were in the first service, they could come here and tell you, say, leave all that thing, just stop. You are not wiser than anybody. People were born before you and people have learned to fight before you. You will fail. They always fail. Worse, uh, 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 worse than that, likely you sin against God and defile your body again and walk around in pain. So what happens when you leave school? You are their father, their mother? Stop it. Is it not read, read book that led to the first time? Leave all of that. Don't deceive yourself at all. They don't even need you like that. Leave old flames alone. They will burn you. On the issue of living with someone to practice patience and all, what if the person never changes or acknowledges your good work? Abi, you see. Did I say they will acknowledge? I said, okay, so your lecturers must come and say, you did very well. You passed ah, your results. Ah, star student. Well done. For you to know you did well. You're not doing it for your lecturer. You're doing it for your future. For you. You're not even doing it for your future spouse. You're doing it for yourself. Do you know what they call enlightened self-interest? Huh? You don't know what enlightened self-interest is? <laughs> you know what self-interest is? You know when you go and learn how to sew in addition to your certificate? Huh? Is it hard? But is it possible to be putting cash in your hand? Does it bring sight? Does it bring something? That's self-interest that is enlightened. 
Not just sitting there and saying, I'm looking out for myself. I'm not doing something. This thing I described is what you do to help you. So by the time your spouse is acting a certain way, you want to get angry. Like, let me tell you why people feel very angry with their spouses. Because you're like, I can take it from anybody, but why you? You are the one who should love me. You are the one person who should not act like that towards me. It's carrying that thing in your head that will give you most of your problems. Just forget that thing. I'm sorry. No, are you saying my spouse won't make up? The... He will, she will, but they will fail. There will be times they are like, beg, leave me alone. In their mind, I don't care. Whether you feel hot or not, I don't give a hoot. There will be times that they will be utterly selfish. There are times they will yield to the devil and say, oh God, go and, find some, go and buy something and eat. You better buy something and eat. Oh. You see me, so I'm not cooking. You're like, what? And they do it. Now, what will you do? Divorce them? Eh? Or they'll go and put, do something that you're clearly saying, this house, you won't eat noodles. And they'll say, I better manage. You got to manage. <laughs> now, is it right? Completely wrong. I'm utterly against it. But again, will you divorce her? You beat her? Will you slap her? Oh. So what will you now do? Go out and buy a bitch. She told you to go and buy food since she have gone and bought food. <laughs> Women, better delete that thing from among. If you ever use it, don't say my pastor even said it. I did, I will never support you. So if you like, don't cook. Plan your life. Cook on Saturday <laughs> and Sunday. So please forget about acknowledging your good work. I don't know what you mean. Mopping of floor, that thing is illustration you gave. That's my present di dilemma, and it's with my father. You need to be flogged. <laughs> you need to be flogged. But let me not say it so they won't flog you on the road. God have mercy on you. Your father. You can't endure with your father. Then Kunle. <laughs> you, you don't understand. What you cannot endure from your father, you even have the space to be angry. Then there's no need now. Make sure I don't marry for the next two years. Though. You have a lot of work. You're not serious. You want to point out to your father that that is the floor. <laughs> oh, God. Hey, have mercy on this child. Is there a particular reason why God was particularly mad at Moses? Partic okay, Moses. So much. I despise please. God refused. What has that to do with anything we study? So this question about Moses, I'm keeping it. This other one about BBS and Hades, the place of the dead, I'm keeping it too. And uh, maybe Wednesday, you come and ask your question. He's going to prepare a place for them. Come and take. Please, whoever asks these questions, these ones, hmm? this one about Moses and this one about Hades and preparing a place to come and take you there. These are things I've answered so many times over the years. Almost any old person can answer you, okay? So as you're living here now, say, have you been here for up to two years? Three, answer this question. Just be discussing it as you're walking. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Just ask that question as your leg, they walk out, they go, okay? Other than that, please keep it also. If they raise it again on Wednesday, if they pass you a note, say, I, was, I want that question answered so we know they are present. I will answer it. It's not a hard question. And it's not easy to answer because you need to open multiple verses to prove it. And I don't want to do that. We've overshot my time for more than an hour. So I'm sorry. It's an easy thing for the old people. In a situation where you report a wrong done to the pastor and question this wrong done in the church, but the pastor tells you, one, it's a church thing. Two, church matters are not questioned. Three, the individuals in the church are human, so I should not expect them to be angels. Yes, I'm perfect. Yes. Do I let it slide and pretend not to see it? I wish you were more specific. So it depends. If, for example, there's a leader, like one cat. You know how you have examples? You can't even tell it. It's so nasty. Cat, God. Which example do I use? But I was thinking of a real example. Many, many years here in this town. Many years, 15 years ago or something. You're up to 15. Should be. You know, I'm one popular musician 
all that. You know, and they will do something and then they go and report and zero happens. Like, so it's likely, of course, many times the pastor is like that. So <laughs> maybe they are their mentor. So they would say things like, it doesn't matter. The correct thing to do is to address a thing. If it's bothering someone, it should be addressed. When I know something is bothering someone in this church or more than one person or might be a matter, I come, I stand and address it. I won't call the characters or the people involved. I don't want them to feel embarrassed, but I, I let them know in case there's a, this happens, this is what to do. Don't think we condone it. Remember, those that are strong ought to bear the burdens of the weak. So you don't let someone be a stumbling block to any of these little ones. The Bible says it's better a stone was tied on your neck you were thrown into the depths of the sea. All right? So I don't know what you mean by keeping on voicing it out. I think if you're in a church where they ignore evil, you should leave. I'm sure you're not talking about this church group. I think you should leave it. If you see evil going on, I want to give the example of a young, a, a praise leader. You know, they used to have this big program. You know, but you call this girl and tell her disgusting things and just attempt things and do things like that. You don't go reporting that to a pastor and they say the church thing, this and that, and it goes on. It's a lie. If they do nothing, then you know likely the pastor is like that. Or the pastor is more interested in the music going on, more interested in the person's services, doesn't care. On the other hand, there are situations where you tell someone something and the leader, I have been in that situation, you hear something, and you are taking action behind. It's not public action. And they don't know. The public does not know. You, that knows. You expected they should do a certain thing. And what I tell my people is, come to me. If, if you expect something and it's not being done, don't hide. Don't be afraid. If you're afraid, write it down. Pass it to someone to pass to someone to pass to me. I've given them permission and said, I won't ask who sent it. If you don't want to be known, just write anonymous. Don't bother. Don't be afraid. So if something has to be addressed, because sometimes you think you know it's something and you don't really know. You don't really know. So, someone may have done wrong and repented about it completely. So why are you bringing public when you did wrong? Was it brought public? So what's that? There are things that need to be publicized. There are those that don't need to be. All right. So again, your illustration is limiting in your expression. I can't answer better than that because you didn't give me more detail. Amen? Amen. All right. Have you learned anything today? Yes, sir. All this marriage talk, eh? Kai, God, have mercy. Marriage talk. Uh, so blame me on the marriage talk. We are going to pray. My emphasis was on dogs, separated life, how we are meant to. And then you can say we apply this specifically to marriage. Give an example. Make sure you don't hook up with a dog. Make sure you are not a dog. Someone that will go back to old behavior. For, work on yourself. Focus on being faithful now. Focus on being consistent. Focus on growing in goodness, righteousness, and truth. That's what we must do. Practice it. When you marry, let it be when you speak. Your spouse knows you always tell the truth. You're a truthful person. Not the one that you are still, you always had a weakness with lying. Then you continue. Now you are messing with the foundation. You're messing with your marriage. When your spouse can't trust you, where is this joy and happiness you're talking about? Where do you want it to come from? When nobody knows what you're saying, whether it's true or false. So focus on yourself. And pray, if you, whenever you get to know your spouse, you pray for them. You know, you're watching and learning. If you notice that the person that says they want to marry you is always telling lies, don't you think you should pause? They may have a demon of lies. I've cast demons of lies out of people. And they went, ah, ah. Don't think. It's not everything that someone does that is there. I've seen people that love the Lord and don't like lying. They feel very bad. Whenever they lie, they come back and confess. And they say, I don't even know what's wrong with me. It seems I just lie even without thinking. And I've prayed for people and seen manifestations of things going. This is real. So when you see something in a person, don't presume. It's like that thing about immorality. Many spouses, that's the point. So, you know, you presume. 
They, they just want to cheat on you. No, many of them, they are very committed. When I marry, I will not ever cheat on my wife. Even unbelievers. But have you cast out the spirits that might be there? Some people don't have any demons associated with them, but some people have. They have received demons of promiscuity. So you keep saying funny things like, can you imagine the fine wife he married? Have you ever seen his wife? Very fine woman. I can't even imagine why he... It has nothing to do with fineness. The spirit of promiscuity on him, on her, must move. That's what you should have been doing before marriage. Presenting yourself or your spouse-to-be to be cleaned up like, like the wedding dress you rented is going to be cleaned. Rather, you focused on wedding dress. You didn't focus on your internal state. And you see, please, I, why am I stressing this thing so much? I always do stress it when I speak about it. Because I don't hear others stressing it as they should. But even more important, of course, I don't listen to many others anymore. So in recent years, so who knows? They might be stressing it. But from the common reaction, I don't think people hear it enough. But more importantly, can you stress these things with your friends? Or if you don't want too many of your friends coming to live in your house in the future, stress it now. If you don't want to be in the center of resolving marriage issues, talk to them now. Don't, the, the, so I'm happy for you. Are you sure you shouldn't be grieving for them? Is there everything you're happy for someone for? There's not everything. I'm happy for you. Hey, yeah. He's just about to start experiencing hell or bringing hell on top of someone. And you say you're happy. You know he's a randy soul. Has 18 girlfriends. And you're happy for the girl? Is she not finished? It is far better. This is why I told my people. Someone said, I won't marry you, male or female. You're in agreement. You have somehow come into agreement. You've gone through the process or procedure of the church, and you think he's married. I would suggest, if they are outsiders from far away or from wherever, I would suggest you keep them around. Though. Let them hear your pastor long ago. It will cast out some things oh, before the D day. Oh. It may take two years. Oh. One is not married. No, we have married class for three months. So what? So what? This your spouse to be have been dealing with for four years and has had endless marriage class. It is still very problematic, very stubborn. You, you just came three months. Three months. It's not just talk. It's not teachings. Literally, laying on the fans, you spirit of immorality. Leave! If you don't cast it out, people have had spirits of loss. I've known people. I don't know how do I explain this. <laughs> how do I say it? <sighs> but a spirit of loss, you know, fighting, struggling. But the day the person was delivered, thank God it didn't happen in a public meeting because those deliverances were happening in public. The person was in private and had a very powerful ejaculation. Pah! That's the day the demon left. That's the first time I've said it out. Chai. Bonus. But fact, person was serious Christian, but lost to grab him like this. He, he, he will be almost. You think everything is natural? Everything is not natural, I beg. Everything is not natural. Is it pornography or masturbation? There are people that are married. They prefer to masturbate than marry, that be with their spouse. Do you understand how crazy that is? They prefer to be in front of pornography, watching porn, and their spouse is in the house. It's not that the spouse said, leave me alone. You think, what is natural about that? So it's not about whoever comes out wearing a nice suit or a nice dress and speaking good English. What has that to do with what happens inside? When you think people, have you heard couples when they say in court, irreconcilable differences? Have you ever asked what that means? I'm not trying to scare you of uh, you. I've told you you want to be scared. Be scared about yourself. Stop looking at someone else. It's you. Be scared of you. Now go to work. Go to work. Go to work. Love God. Learn about God. Learn the fear of God. It is the fear of God that can make my wife be at peace. 
I can travel years ago. I used to travel a lot in my work at the time. Travel here, travel there, be here, be there. You know, stay in hotel rooms endlessly, up and down and everywhere. My wife is not staying and saying, where are you? Is there anybody there with you? Turn your camera around. <laughs> there was never anything like that. The self-control I had acquired over a 20-year a period before I married, that self-control helped me. So I, I think if someone goes from being having boyfriend, girlfriend all around, he just get born again. I, I'm inclined to say, wait first. Hey, there's someone I like, wait first. Uh, if God said yes. I prayed about it, God said yes. Pastor, have you prayed? Yes, I prayed. What did God say? Yes. Hey, hey now, what's stopping it? Let's fix the date. No. I'm 100% sure God said you should marry her. I'm also 100% sure it is not time because there's a time for everything. Do you understand? This is what people don't understand. How many of you like corn? Fresh corn? Go and plant it. You, will you plant? Who wants to plant corn? You harvest it by January. Who wants to plant? How many of you know it will not work? Some of you don't even know what we are talking about. <laughs> How many of you know you cannot plant corn now? You will not have any crop. Forget it. The conditions of the weather, rain, dry season, all. It will never, you will never harvest any corn. There's a time for everything. That's the point. God has said, yes, it is him, it is her. Did you ask when? It may be four years from now. If I was here, I wouldn't tell them anything yet. Maybe two years to the time I'll tell, or three. Not four. Because next thing you're communicating daily. Then you're on fire. Then a marriage that have started in integrity and dignity starts with immorality. Then for the rest of your married life, even though God has never stopped loving both of you, that tree of mistrust, of unfaithfulness you planted, plagues you. So I would rather now that we know, let's be developing. Spend time, give it time. I repeat, whoever are the specific people that this message is for that won't let us go. See, you will never be able to say God did not love you. You will never be. You see everybody that is here because of you. You will never be able to say God did not love you. I know all of you need the message, but this, they are specific people. You will never be able to say God did not love you. And you were not warned. You will never be able to say it. Angels are my witness. Humans are my witness. All of you take note. Because one day, one will put a bone in their nose and can't say, that girl you're talking, you're talking about me, but I just said that maybe you, me, 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 me. Usually what happens is that when I say something and I, I can't drop it, it means someone is still arguing. You know, one day, many, it happens hundreds of times, but it is a funny one. So I remember I was preaching. I kept standing here. I, I won't say, I won't tell you. <laughs> I tell you that the person that did it was here. Okay. person was sitting here somewhere. They were newer. And I was talking and I said, you know this typhoid thing? Many times it's not typhoid. It's just this and that. See that medicine, you're, see you're wasting your time. Better get rid of that medication. All that. It's not typhoid or anything. Doctors said this. Real doctors have said this, this, this. So they just use you to get money. And then I'll get back to my message. What has typhoid to do with message? I can't. Then I'll leave it. Then the last time I said, ah, eh, eh. After the meeting, somebody around here <laughs> now told somebody, they invited them and said, do you know pastor only stopped saying that thing? The moment I said in my mind, okay, I will not swallow it again. That's the only time he would, could stop. That's when he said, I will not say it again. And I was free. Now, did I know? Did I know that the young lady had typhoid medication in her handbag that was this close to me? And, and, and that she had been wasting her time and her money. And when she stopped swallowing, didn't she get well? She got well. And all of that, you know, all those unnecessary headaches that you get from swallowing antibiotics. You don't even know. You're weakening your immune system. Antibiotics weaken your immune system. That's why you're prone to get sick thereafter. Your immune system goes weak because antibiotics generate things to fight for you. So your body's natural generation of fighters, the, an the antibodies, Weakens since there's no, it's like someone who never does something, others are doing it for them. That's what antibiotics do. No, maybe number one money maker for pharmacists in this nation. You have malaria, you have typhoid, 
almost none of you have ever had typhoid. You're like, no, they tested me. You didn't have typhoid. You uh, go and do test tomorrow. Last time I gave this experiment, I told someone, go and do a test for malaria. I sent five people, I paid for it. They came back. Out of five, two or three came back with malaria positive. Perfectly healthy people. I, I, I said five people that are perfectly healthy. Go and do tests. You see if, you're, if you don't have malaria and typhoid. They came back with tests. They were positive for malaria and typhoid. But they're 100% healthy. They felt not sick at all. I want to explain, because I've said it for years, many people don't believe it. You're in Nigeria, and on average, it's plasmodium parasite of some sort inside your blood. So a lot of time, you're, you're running after what is not missing. And they know. Some know, some don't. But they don't care. Money is the thing. <laughs> it's a matter of cash. So I'm saying when something holds on like this, usually it's because there's someone that is... I want you all to... Uh, well, I, I pray God will show you mercy, whoever you are, or whoever you are. <laughs> I pray God will show you mercy and grace, and you will not be wiser than your fathers. I pray you will believe and you will receive grace to be patient. For through faith and patience, you will obtain the promises. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Before, before you stand up and pray, please, if there's anything else you'd like to ask or you felt I like didn't answer it too well, please, you can get Sister Nebel Mokasos number, send her, written. Ask for more clarity. Ask more specifically, okay? You know, she'll forward it to me. I will send back the answer. I can do a voice note and answer you, even today if I get it. And I'm, I'm reminded, okay? So anything else you want to ask, please. Not a separate question that has to do with the things we emphasized. Other things come on Wednesday, 5 p.m. Bible study, and we can answer it. You don't know, it might become the whole sermon if it's something I've not spoken of much. Other than that, the technical teams can give you sometimes many messages where I've answered that thing. All right? God wants you to understand. Remember, understanding is... What will produce fruit? I'd like us to stand to our feet. Have you learned anything? Yes. Do you think God has loved you? Yes. I'd like to lift your hands and tell the Lord, thank you very much for the things I've heard and learned. Father, we are grateful. Father, we are grateful. We thank you for understanding, for enlightenment, for revelation, for wisdom. Thank you for the truth that makes us free. Thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Thank you. Thank you for the spirit of truth. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I want us to ask the Lord... For understanding like you've never had. Now listen, I know I pray that for you. I prayed that at the beginning. I asked for the spirit of truth. And the Lord has done that. But I want you to very specifically ask the Lord. Specifically for yourself. You use one minute, okay? And just appeal to him and say, please. I personally, not because Pastor Ita prayed it. I personally want to have what they call knowledge and understanding. You need it. Without it, you will not bear fruit. Go and read Philippians 1. And this is my prayer from verse 9, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, that you may be able to discern what is best. Even this marriage matter, to be able to discern what is best is as your love abounds more and more in knowledge and understanding. So you can discern, this is a good person, this is a bad person, this is a very selfish person. This is a person that will acquire endless debt. This is a person who will make our family life wretched. This one is going to weaken. You know, you can, God can begin to give you all of that. If you abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Even if God still says, I want you to marry them, but you know what to expect. So you can start preparing towards it. You can know what book to tell your spouse to be. Hey, let's read this book together. 
Because you're not so carried away by the person's beauty or good looks. You're not carried away by their good job. <coughs> you're able to discern what is best. That's what scripture says. And that you may be pure and blameless till the day of Christ. Filled with the fruit of righteousness. This is Philippians 1. That comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. The fruits of righteousness will abound in your life. We are talking about fruit. Fruit that comes from holy living. When you separate yourself from God, you grow in knowledge. When you grow in knowledge, you produce fruit. When the master comes for you, he will say, this is a good tree. And he will bless you. You will receive rewards. When you are unfruitful, you will be cut down. Pray about these things. Tell the Lord what you desire. Father, we desire to be fruitful trees. Full of knowledge. Full of understanding. Full of insight. Oh Lord, help us. Help us be prepared. Help us comprehend. Help us walk in everything we need. Good God. Thank you, Lord God. Amen. Please, I encourage everyone, when you go back, always go back and pray about things and study, go through the message, go through the scriptures. Make sure you do. Remember, um, even what I'm sharing here is the fruit of my own relationship with God over the years from the knowledge I've acquired and all of that. That's where I'm just taking from my fruit. I'm plucking from the things I have gotten. To share a little with you. There's a lot more where it came from. But how long has it taken to cultivate it? Very many years. Very many years. 20 something years. Almost 30. A long time. You, some of you have almost nothing. Very little knowledge on anything. So focus. Apply yourself. Sit under. Learn. Ask questions. The Bible, number one friend. The final prayer, I want you to pray. I already prayed a little for you, but let's just, let me just give you a few seconds to pray for yourself. Ask God that you be prepared for married life. And God should, pre listen, this one you pray very little. In fact, forget it, I'll pray it. Only pray for yourself, forget your spouse to be. Pray for yourself, Father, help me prepare, help me prepare, help me prepare, help me prepare, Lord God, help me be prepared day and night, however you would, to grow in love and knowledge and understanding. Help me be prepared, Lord God, in skill and ability, in patience and kindness. Oh, Lord, my God, help me learn from the people around me, the circumstances. Help me learn, help me learn, help me learn, learn, learn. Almighty God, help me learn and grow and help me humble myself, knowing I will need it. I will need tons of humility. In the days to come. Equip me, O oh God. Equip us. Equip everyone in this place. Equip your children, O oh God. Show them mercy. Let them have delightful lives ahead. In the midst of the challenges, let them have the weapons of fruit already prepared. Oh, thank you, Lord God. Capacity comes from you. Blessed be your name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Father, I ask for everyone's future spouse here. You know them. I ask that you prepare them too. Amen. Prepare them.
prepare them to match, prepare them in growth, prepare them even with the tests. Let the temptation or the challenge they will present, let these ones be prepared to surmount. Amen. Let the challenge these ones will present, let them be prepared to surmount. Amen. Whatever is meant for evil, let it work for good. Amen. This is my prayer. Amen. Give grace. Amen. Give more grace. Amen. Give grace. Amen. Do more than we can ask for. Imagine. Let them have wonderful testimonies of your kindness. Amen. Let them be able to teach others. Lord, put a passion and love in our hearts to help our brethren and loved ones out there. May we be, not be those who keep quiet and watch people fall into a deep pit. Give us the bonus to love. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen. And before I pray the closing prayer, if you have an offering, you weren't here in the first service, or you, did, you know, you can give or you can make a transfer. Father, I'm asking that every offering given that you receive it and use it for your glory and extend your kingdom. I ask that you replenish, and I ask that you provide for the needy in our midst. Let them not lack what they need. Father, I ask that you teach them to be good stewards of what they have. Give grace, give favor, even today. Every need be supplied. Thank you. Amen. I ask as they go, bless them, keep them, give them grace. Give them knowledge and understanding. Make them a light wherever they go. Let them shine on everyone they come across. Amen. May no bushels cover our light. Amen. Let them be used to bring honor to the name of Jesus. Amen. Let the fruits of goodness, righteousness, and truth follow them all the days of their lives. Amen. Thank you. Amen.